Oh, um, good evening. I want to call the um, June 20th, 2017 meeting of the Brattleboro Select Board to order. Um, our first order of business is to approve the meeting minutes for the, oh, wait a second, this is July 11th. Sorry, this is the July 11th meeting of the Broward Select Board. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes of the June 20th meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Um, all those in favor of approving the minutes of the June 20th, 2017 meeting, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, the motion carries 4-0. As you'll note, we only have four of us this evening. Um, which means if we vote on anything in order for it to pass, it has to get three votes. Because if it's 2-2, two, two, it means it dies. So I'll just alert everybody to that. Um, Wouldn't we need three votes even if there was five of us? <laughs> no, but 2-2. Two, two, okay. okay. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Um, I want to start the meeting off with <coughs> making a few comments about the recent overdoses that we've had here in our community. Um, as many people know, we've had a total of 12 over the 4th of July holiday, 8 on July 4th, and 4 on July 5th. And um, I think I probably speak for everyone when I say this was a very upsetting event for our community for so many reasons. Um, but it's really important for all of us to remember that we're not alone in this. This is a state problem and it's also a problem around the country. And I think that um, we are lucky in our community that we have a small enough um, community that we can take, you know, look out for each other. And there are law enforcement, um, medical services, and social service agencies that are all working on this issue together. And um, it's not going to be, it's not something that's easy to solve, um, but we're going to, everyone's coming together to see what they can do. So hopefully we won't have anything like this again. It's abnormal to have 12 in that um, period of time. Um, so. It's hard to say anything happy about that, but I just wanted everyone to really put it in perspective and understand what's happening. Now on a totally lighter note, I feel so bad going from that to a lighter note, um, we did have a 4th of July parade on the 4th of July, and I just want to thank um, all the volunteers that put it together, as well as our town um, departments. The police department is involved. The fire department always puts that big flag up over Main Street. Um, Public Works helps out. And especially Carol lot and everybody at the Parks and Rec Department who do all the afternoon activities. So we want to thank all of them to, for making it a very successful day for everybody. Um, and then because Brenda Siegel has to leave, I'm hoping that no one on the board minds that we move up the proclamation for the Southern Vermont Dance Festival and we do it now as opposed to an hour and a half from now. Would that be good, Brenda? Yes. <laughs> okay. My son would really appreciate it. Okay. Um, before we read the proclamation, do you want to get up and talk about, give yourself a small sure. commercial about the Southern Vermont Dance Festival? Sure. And if you can go up, you have to go to the mic so that people... I have a degree in dance, but can't walk. So, uh, so the Southern Vermont Dance Festival starts in, on Thursday of this week, um, and it's our fifth season, and uh, it's bigger than ever. We have more, definitely more people coming to town than we've ever had. We have full classes. We've always had big classes, but we've never filled classes. We have lots of full classes this season. Um, we have incredible performances happening at the Latches. We've added a, with Edible Brattleboro, we've added a community potluck that we're hoping that everybody comes to, whether they can afford to bring a dish or not, or have time to bring a dish or not. And that's on Thursday, July 13th at 6.30. Um, and it takes place in Harmony Place, unless it's raining like it always is. And then it will be in the River Garden. Uh, and we have a social justice resistance promenade around downtown Brattleboro. You can come pick up a map at the River Garden. That's a new thing also um, on Saturday morning. And also very special Sister Moses uh, story of Harriet Tubman by donation at the Latches at 1 o'clock on that Saturday. Those are our community events. We also have incredible performances at the Latches Thursday and Friday and a Midsummer Night's Picnic at Scott Farm. 
um, with uh, performances that you see as you get led on a t walking tour around the farm. So we're very excited for it to be our fifth season and to have made it this far against what sometimes <laughs> seems like the odds um, and to make dance be something that drives the economy uh, long term in this community. I think uh, really connecting the arts and business together, which is something that I feel is really important. Thank you, Brenda. That's awesome. um, unless anyone else would like to, I will read the proclamation if that's OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, Don't know. <laughs> That's Wait. fine. No. <laughs> you don't want us to read it? No, that's okay. <laughs> yes. I didn't think you'd mind, Brenda. Um, whereas the Southern Vermont Dance Festival began in 2013 in response to the devastation that the downtown experienced from the aftermath of Tropical Storm Irene and the Brooks House fire as a way to offer education in the arts and to grow the creative economy, and whereas the Southern Vermont Dance Festival has grown quickly and become a staple dance festival to the local business and arts community, as well as to the dance community internationally, and whereas now in its fifth season, the Southern Vermont Dance Festival is celebrating the theme of diversity and social justice through arts and engagement, and whereas the mission of this Southern Vermont Dance Festival is to, quote, provide an educational dance opportunity that is accessible to all levels of interest, from the dance <coughs> enthusiast to the dance professional, by offering world-class instruction in many genres, in addition to offering performance opportunity to choreographers from the emerging artist to the well-established professional. The Southern Vermont Dance Festival will be an economic driver for the community by using local businesses as vendors and keeping most activities in the downtown area, thus driving visitors of the festival into local businesses for shopping, eating, and enjoying. And whereas the Southern Vermont Dance Festival attracts attendees, artists, and professionals from all over the world, including Europe, Spain, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and from every corner of this country. Artists such as the principals from New York City Ballet, Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane Company, New York Live Arts, Axis Dance Company, Adrian Hawkins, Ryan Casey, and more attend the festival each year and perform and teach to all levels and interests, making dance accessible to all. And whereas the four-day festival serves all ages and offers a unique format in dance education and exhibition, with 40 world-renowned <laughs> faculty, 35 choreographers, over 113 master classes, a camp for children, three gala, galas probably, two informal and dozens of free community performances, live music and performance art, collaborations <coughs> with Vermont Performance Lab, Edible Brattleboro and Marlboro College, a Midsummer Night's Picnic, a Social Justice Resistance Promenade, the story of Harriet Tubman, as well as its first ever community potluck. The Southern Vermont Dance Festival is a versatile experience in dance and the arts that utilizes downtown Brattleboro as a campus for the event. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Brattleboro Select Board does hereby proclaim July 13th through 16th, 2017 as Southern Vermont Dance Festival Weekend. Dated Brattleboro, Vermont, this 11th day of July, 2017, and signed by the Brattleboro Select Board. Well, Do I, I had, is there a, 
We're gonna get it all signed okay. for you and then give you it's a nice okay. pretty copy. But yeah. we'll get it to you before the festival. We'll have it framed. <laughs> I think you might be promising a bit too much. That is. <laughs> thank you very much. No, thank you, Brenda, and thanks for putting on the event. Wish Ajna luck for us. Um, um, the, um, the town manager has um, no comments this evening, so I want to wonder if anyone on the board has any comments or committee reports. No committee reports. I would just like to add, because Kate won't do this, uh, for the 4th of July parade, uh, the O'Connors are very heavy into that. So I would like to thank uh, the O'Connor family, and especially Kevin, Kevin, who probably drives himself insane for 364 days a year <laughs> before the event. And he always does a fantastic job, along with all the other people. But Kevin's the one that basically takes the brunt of everything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he did a great job. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, if you ever want to feel really good about your town, you want to march right behind Alfred. Oh. Yes, <laughs> you'll think the cheers are for you. The cheers, we <laughs> pretended. Yes. Randy and I pretended exactly. the cheers were for us. We did. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're never. They were but it no. was fun anyway. And I, I want to thank you for making your comments about the overdoses and thank our first responders for always going to these things with care and compassion and, and being right there on the mark. And, and thanks to Captain Mark Harrigan for the article he wrote in the Reformer, which I thought was very well done. Thanks. Anybody else? Thanks, Brandy. Um, now I want to open the floor for public participation. So if there's anyone in the audience <coughs> who wants to comment or say something about anything that's not on tonight's agenda, this is the time to do it. And I see you looking. Yeah, if you come up to the microphone and give us your name and where you're from. And the microphone is for the television, so you're not gonna hear yourself amplified. Ah, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> um, my name is Sam Payne, and uh, we moved here two years ago, my wife and I, whose name is Sandra Foisy. She's from Switzerland originally, uh, so that she could teach at NECA, the New England Center for Circus Arts. Um, we moved here after touring the world with Cirque du Soleil and other shows. Uh, we've known Elsie and Serenity Smith the founders of NECA for over 25 years. And um, I'm here tonight because unfortunately NECA is in a state of crisis right now. Um, the board of directors has, over the last nine months, focused their efforts on removing uh, Elsie and Serenity uh, from their positions as artistic directors in the school, and they did so yesterday. In the meantime, what we presume is internal start strife within the board has reduced the number to two people uh, they have a minimum of seven in order to function effectively. We think they may have added other board members yesterday, but the school is in a state of crisis. They've simply, uh, they've just moved into their new building, beautiful building off Route 5. Um, it's a building that's one of the few purpose-built circus buildings in the United States. Uh, the board has been meeting secretively. We have not uh, been able to find out how the finances are, and uh, we're in a state of great anxiety. We're reaching out to the community to ask them to step forward, uh, see the facts as they may, and take action to get involved. Uh, it's very important. I think um, NECA is one of the jewels in Brattleboro's crown. There are many, but it's a simply wonderful place. So if we're asking if you care about circus, and if you care about the circus school in the community, please Get involved, uh, make your own mind up, and take it from there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Well, what I, I'm just wondering, what is it that we can that we can do, or just, you know, other than just putting it out to the public to. I think that's what's happened. Yeah, I think yeah That's what you've done tonight. Yeah, yeah. it's very new. Um, yes. So there are <laughs> Facebook groups and uh, associated. Um, groups being set up right now. I would think perhaps writing the board of directors would be a good idea, certainly visiting the school, checking in, simply being concerned at this point and keeping your ears open and knowing something's on the horizon would be great. Well, if I'm just wondering what yeah, what the local people can do if, who are watching or maybe if it gets written up in the paper, what, what can they actually do to, I mean, just to go there and... Uh, yeah, I'm so, there's one of the questions I asked the yeah. teachers group when they told me about the select board meeting and asked me to come. Um, and uh, you could certainly write the Board of Directors at NECA. Um, 
the other groups are being set up, unfortunately, now. So um, uh, I'm afraid I can't give you uh, an address to write to. I wish I could. Um, but at this point, it's more just to raise awareness and get people active and start thinking about what might be possible. Um, I mean, it'd certainly be wonderful if, if, I don't know if it's possible for the city to get involved in any way, but um, probably not. But yeah. if it is to express right. concern and go see what's happening, <clears throat> you know. Um, the problem that we have is we don't know what the motivation of the board is because they haven't been open at all in their, in their proceedings. Hmm. Uh, so we literally don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and it's, you know, it's taken only nine months to bring an organization that was mm -hmm. unified. Mm -hmm. The staff has risen up in its entirety mm -hmm. um, in support of Elsie and Serenity. About half of them are resigning right now. Wow. Uh, oh, so God, it's uh, serious, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. So, But there will be much more clarity in the next few days. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Bridget McBride. I'm also here on behalf of NECA. I am a member of the community. Mm -hmm. Not only do professionals come from all over the world to train at NECA, as we just heard, but also local community members like me and like my fellow circus <coughs> crazies here. <laughs> um, I have been attending NECA classes for about five years and love it, love it, love it because of what Elsie and Serenity have built and the coaches that they have hired and the fact that all the coaches are now leaving because of what's happening is very upsetting to us as members of the community. Um, and I know that Elsie and Serenity are members of this community, people know them, people know their kids, people, you know, are on Facebook with them, so support them as much as possible and try to get them reinstated if we can do anything. Um, we are, we just heard about this today. So what has been going on in the board has been kept very quiet, we had no idea. Um, and now we're being told by our coaches who are very dear to us that uh, they're crying on the phone with us about this. So it's very upsetting. Um, we have a letter that is um, going to be sent to the board from us community members, um, and I'd like to read it. It's very short. Uh, we are community students at NECA and have just heard the devastating news of the impending forced termination of LC and Serenity, as well as the potential resignation of many wonderful coaches. Many of us have been drawn to NECA because of Elsie and Serenity's experience with Cirque du Soleil, their world-class training abilities, and their desire to share circus with people of all abilities. And that includes circus for cancer survivors and for kids with autism. And I mean, Elsie and Serenity's idea of making circus accessible for everyone not only rings true for us, but is also a great business strategy. By exposing non-professional students to the joys of circus like us, it diversifies NECA's revenue and creates highly committed community students who provide a significant and continuous stream of financial support for NECA and for the community. That amazing facility would not have been built without the Brattleboro community supporting. Um, we sign up for several classes every session, workshops, private lessons, teacher trainings, and we trust and love our coaches. We are deeply saddened by the current events and hope that the board and the coaches can resolve the immediate issues and work toward a more constructive future. If our coaches resign, we will stand in solidarity and withdraw from all classes and demand a refund. Elsie, Serenity, the coaches they have selected, and the community they have created are NECA, and we are not interested in NECA without them. We think, we think you will find it impossible to replace them with coaches of the same caliber and predict that without them, NECA will flounder and fail, which is not in anyone's or Brattleboro's best interest. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please, yes. Um, I have safety concerns. My primary concern is that while I was just there about a half an hour ago, uh, a man walked up to me. I don't know whether he's on the board or who he is. He walked up and he said, uh, I don't know how to rig a trapeze net. And then he implied that he was just gonna go ahead and try to do that because, but the problem is they don't have the people there that are qualified to do that, at least at the moment. Maybe they'll get them there, but I think that's a really serious concern. Mm -hmm. I mean, that raises a huge <laughs> alarm bell to me. Um, uh, Elsie and Serenity are world-class, as everybody has said, world-class artists. They know about security and they have been going there for years. They are safety fanatics because they're running a circus school and they don't want people to get hurt. I do not see that level of concern. Uh, what I see is the board saying that they don't, that everybody's replaceable. 
and that is simply not the case. And what I saw just recently really, really deeply concerned me for, my child goes there. I don't want people who don't know how to rig setting up circus equipment. I find that terrifying. So I won't be bringing my child there tomorrow because I don't trust that they know what they're doing. I mean, literally from what they just said, <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not just like implying that something negative happened, like I actually heard it. Mm -hmm. So that is a concern for me. Thank you. Hmm. Was there anyone else that wants to make a comment about something not on the agenda? Yeah. I feel singularly unqualified to comment. My name is Crystal Fielding. I'm just a community <laughs> member taking a class there. I just heard about this. I have no idea what the reasoning is, but just talking to my coach and a couple of other coaches that were there, I understand that it's completely financial administrative decision. Elsie and Serenity are not there as administrative staff. They are the heart and the soul of the organization, oh, and it hurts this community to have this happen to them. And um, who do you think is going to, what circus artist is going to come here and support an organization that, that throws <coughs> them out on their ear like that <coughs> after what they've built? So I just, I just wanted to say, I think it's going to be very hard to find replacements for them, um, given the, the harshness and the suddenness of what's happened here and the bad feeling that it's created in the community. So that's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Hmm. Can I say something? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what to say about as far as anything that we can do at this point or should do, indeed. But... Um, I've personally known Elsie and Serenity for over 15 years, I think, and Bill. And, and Bill, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's upsetting to us, too, so I yeah. hope... We're just hearing this right yeah, now. Yeah, we're just hearing it. I got a <laughs> yeah. personal message about an hour ago, yeah. so it's all pretty fresh, as yeah. you know. So I just want to say uh, my heart goes out for you right now, and hopefully... It can be resolved. Yeah, it can be resolved, right. because uh, it's a problem. Well, and it's a brand new building, and it's, I mean, it's a beautiful building. It's a beautiful site. It's, uh, I, one of the customers that I'm working for right now just sent four of her grandchildren there um, for a summer camp. And so this is disheartening to yes. hear in a multi-million dollar building facility, and, and Bill must be heartbroken. I mean, he, yeah. he comes over and helps my mother-in-law with her exercises just because he's a good guy, you know, and uh, so hopefully mm -hmm. something will happen. The community will rally behind this. And mm. Speaking of the oh, circus. Oh, can you go to the, yeah. Sorry. We want the world to hear you, so go to the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a small world. Yeah. I'm terrified. Uh, but circuit, speaking as a circus professional, the, the building is an extraordinary building. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult in the United States without funding. Many other countries, such as Canada, have great arts funding, and here we don't. It's extremely difficult to build the building. I've been talking with Elsie and Serenity about it for, and Bill for probably 20 years, imagining various different buildings. I thought they were crazy when they told me they were going to build it in Brattleboro. I didn't think it was possible, and they did. Can't do that in San Francisco. Can't do that in other places. Right. And it's the building itself, the infrastructure is perfect for circus because it was built for circus, and they built it very intelligently, designed it intelligently. So... Um, my hope is that the building remains and NECA remains with everybody's help. So do we. Thank you. Well, LC and Serenity are NECA. So. Is there anyone else in the public who wants to met, talk about anything that's not on the agenda? Curtis? You, <laughs> and if you would tell, um, just say who you are, even though we know, we want to make sure the public does. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Curtis Reed, Jr. I'm Executive Director for Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity and a Brattleboro resident. Um, and I didn't see anything on the agenda concerning um, my initial question around the demographics of town employees and what, it, what measures are, are being taken place right now. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about Sure. what our plan is. We had at our last meeting, Peter outlined what our plan is to move the whole diversity issue forward. So I don't know if, if yeah. you want to just talk sure. about what that is. So in follow-up to the um, discussion from June 6th, um, on June 20th, I um, presented some additional information to the board, um, recommended, um, I don't have the material right in front of me. There were a couple of additional specific things mm -hmm. um, related to training, uh, primarily. Um, 
but more generally, what I suggested is that, um, as you had spoken to actually during the discussion on the 6th, and I think there was a general consensus both in the um, discussion here in this setting that evening, as well as in some communication I had with people following that meeting, um, the for um, lasting change to occur, it needs to not just be um, a matter of town policy or a matter of town staff, but um, work in and with the community um, to uh, work on the um, welcomingness of Brattleboro as a community. And so I know there's a lot of work that's already going on around that. Um, and my suggestion to the board was that if I had some additional time to work with actually you and others who are in the community who are doing that work um, to get a better understanding of what's already being done and where we might add value uh, to that with official town action that I can then come back and provide better advice about actions that the select board might take so that there'll be you know, some, set, some subset of this that would be about town government and the town staff, but a broader effort that we would um, attempt to be you know, constructively participating in that would be about um, building on the work that's already happening in the community. So we anticipate it'll be um, the end of the summer, probably one of the September um, select board meetings at which we would revisit that issue substantively. And in the meantime, I'll be um, in the community meeting with individuals and groups about what's already happening. Okay, so you're anticipating that the town is going to change how it does recruiting? Is that we, what I'm Well, hearing? we've already begun that effort, um, but we, yeah. we there will be other things that we will do around recruiting as well as um, the training mm -hmm. aspect. There's a whole, actually, we, we did follow up, as we said on the 6th, mm -hmm. we would for the 20th. We did um, follow up work and there was a, a, a body of information that I presented in the notebooks to the board that was online the weekend before the meeting on the 20th and then there was some additional discussion uh, both among the board and with the public at that meeting on the 20th. And from that flowed the, um, follow-up actions that I just described. I'd be happy to get with you to provide the documentation that was reviewed for the 20th so you can see the follow-up, both the initial follow-up work that was done and I think even more importantly, the plan for how we intend to go forward. Okay, because um, my understanding was that that was gonna do, happen tonight. No. To, no, no. And okay. one of the things that we talked about at the last meeting was we wanna do what we're gonna do, I think we said this when you were here at that other meeting, was we wanna do what we're gonna do what we're doing correctly and involve the right people. So that's why we sort of said, we're gonna not rush this. That's why we wanna, you know, Peter's gonna make a larger presentation in September, you know, after he's been able to talk about to different stakeholders and people in the community. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're on target to, to do everything that we can do. It's just we wanna make sure we do it right. But Curtis, if you, if you noticed, I, I don't know when you, when you got our agenda for the meeting, um, did you just get it today? I just got it today. Okay, so it's online. I mean, you, you can always you can okay. always check ahead of time or even call Jan or yeah. anybody in the town office yeah. to but, see if something's on the agenda. Yeah. But um, I'm wondering if, if it might have come up at the first meeting that we might have said something about the July meeting. Right. You know what I mean? But then when we met in June, we sort of changed the, count, the schedule because mm. we actually have to get there's certain town business that we have to get done, whether it's financial things, and we right. just were over, you know, we've overloaded the town staff on a lot of things, so we want to make sure we're doing it right. So, I mean, that could conceivably, we may have mentioned a July meeting date at the, at first, the, at meeting. the first meeting, and then right. last meeting we said we got to make sure we do everything we're doing right as opposed to just rushing and doing everything not right. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't think we're, nobody's dropping the ball on Oh, it's no, just, not at it's all. Just, I, th I think because of our summer schedule, it's just, yeah. I think things just got pushed back a little bit, but yeah. I think- So we have a plan for September. Yeah. Oh yeah. And in the meantime, we have revised the um, message that appears at the bottom of our ads to make it, instead of just saying, you know, we're an equal opportunity employer, we've made it more specific of races and, and genders and other people that should apply. And we have put out press releases both online and in the papers saying, if you would like to receive our job postings, please let us know, email Peter. Um, and we're hoping that many people have started to take advantage of that. Have you received any people? We have really? received some. Yeah. So, so we've taken that step in the meantime. Okay, yeah. all right. We're committed. We're, we're committed. committed. 
<laughs> We're at the retreat? Or? Yes. Probably. We We're not going to answer that. <laughs> Thanks, Curtis. We should be committed. Thank you. Wait, does anyone else in the public have anything that they want to talk about that's not on the agenda? All right, perfect. Um, now we're going to move um, on to water and sewer business. So I would um, accept a motion to uh, to convene as water and sewer commissioners. So moved. Um, we have a motion to convene as water and sewer commissioners. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Weren't they supposed to do backflips on the way yeah. up? <laughs> yeah. Um, the motion carries, and we are convened as water and sewer commissioners. The first item on the agenda is a request for a rebate of water and sewer late fees. And is the town manager going to talk about this one? So should I be coming? Um, Ms. Dardo, Mrs. Drozdova just asked if I should come up and talk, or do you want me to say yes. anything? Yes, yes. Yes, if you come up to the table, come up to this table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh sure. Well, you'll be on camera there too. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So I am Irina Drozdova, mm -hmm. and I live in Brattleboro. Have been a resident locally at Morningside um, for 11 years, and we have always paid on time. And it just happened that we were out of the country this one time. And my husband was here initially, and so we knew that we had to take care of things, but he's also taking care of my mother right now. And, you know, she's retired and disabled, and so we've been dealing with her. So I was away, he was taking care of her, and we realized two days in, we were late. So he came in to pay, um, but then we got a bill saying there's a $15 late fee, even though we rushed ourselves to get here. So I, w I mean, it's not $15, it's not a big deal, but at the same time, we've always paid on time, and it just happened this one time we slipped up. So is there anything we can do about that? Um, if you say no, that's fine, but I just thought I'd bring it up. Do you want to explain what the process is? Sure. There is a process. So. Um, Anyone who doesn't pay by the deadline for any of the quarters, in this particular quarter, the deadline was May 15th, um, there is an automatic um, late fee that is charged in, in accordance with the um, rate ordinance that applies to water and sewer fees. Um, and there is a provision in that ordinance that allows um, customers to uh, appeal the late charge if they believe that it's been improperly um, imposed. Um, the, the most frequent uh, <laughs> concern that we hear from people who do receive the late charge is that it is an unusual circumstance for the household that um, right. they've always paid on time and that this is you know a one-time thing and it's not they're not going to have a pattern of not paying on time um, but the ordinance doesn't speak to you know if there's been a many years of paying on time and now one time that it's late it doesn't provide relief um, for it being late and in fact select boards previously have um, not viewed that as a sufficient reason to waive the late fees um, there have been circumstances where late fees were waived but that's usually related to something where there was a metering question or there was a um, question about the um, timeliness of the, mm. the sending out of the notice or some other administrative error that might have been made. Um, in this case, we've confirmed that there wasn't an administrative error made, um, and I don't believe that the customers are suggesting that there was, that it was a personal circumstance situation. So um, on behalf of the staff, what I would say is we um, feel for um, the Drozovas. We understand that these things happen, and mm -hmm. it's yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunate. <laughs> Thank but you. I, for the consistency of treating all of the different residents and customers equally, our staff yeah. recommendation would be that you not um, refund the late fees. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I yeah. I just appreciate you even oh. considering it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And all right. I unfortunately have to scoot. I've got to get back to work. But thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah. I can't stay too long just because I'm in the middle of a work session, so thank you. I did ask if I could come by, and they said it would be fine if I came briefly, but I do have to get back, so okay. thank you. Okay. And just so you, before you go, just so you know, we had, I think, nine, seven or nine people appeal last year, and we 
said the same thing. We said about. the same thing that we're saying to you, or we're going to probably say to you, which is we're not going to waive the fee. So you're not alone that we've had to do this before. Right, okay. So I, do, I don't want you to think we're singling you out because we've unfortunately had to, to say to other people we can't waive the fee. Oh, understandable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do I sign No thank problem. You? <laughs> I think it's this. Yes. Is that it? I think it's from the chin. Yeah, thank you. From the chin. Oh, from the chin. <laughs> from the chin. <laughs> yep. There you go. Excellent. Thank All right. you. I'm good. You Any are other good. questions before I leave? <laughs> thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Hey, you too. Thanks for thank coming. <laughs> Do we have See, to take any know. action, or do we? Actually, not? you don't. In the absence okay. of granting the relief, and okay, thank you. you can move yeah. on. And I'm assuming we're all on the same page. I don't want to assume. So I'm asking. Well, that was uh, that was <laughs> us newbies first. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, do you have any okay. Questions? First yeah. time being meanies. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is, so. it, and that one you just we really had to be consistent yeah. through the whole thing. I mean, it's yeah. because we can hear this a lot. I mean, and. That's therein lies the problem. Are we all comfortable? Brandon. No, no, <laughs> no, I'm fine, I'm no. I'm fine. Okay. Okay. I mean, it does. It's it's one of the not good parts of this job. You know, yeah. so. Yes. You have to do it. Um, okay, next up on the agenda is the Welcome is. Center Wastewater Pump Station Upgrade Project, which we have been hearing about. Yes. And we have to take some action tonight. We do. We're very happy to be at the point now where we've got agreements with the various parties that are um, ready for your approval. So there's a lot of material in the backup um, on this item and a couple of other items tonight. But particularly related to this, um, a quick refresher that the pump station, the existing pump station was built in 1995. Um, it was anticipated to have approximately a 20 year life and then it would need to be fully refurbished. So we're a couple of years past that. It really does desperately need to be fully refurbished. We've had some pump failure out there and some electrical fa failure. Um, but the, we've also been working together with the state over the last couple of years to develop the plan that is now ready to um, uh, move forward with. It's before you tonight. It is owned, a facility that is owned by the state, it was built by the state um, initially to service the Welcome Center, but also to provide some service to an adjacent area of Guilford and an adjacent area of Brattleboro. The part of Brattleboro that it serves is the Delta Business Campus, mm -hmm. which is where, among other businesses located there um, in 2011, the Commonwealth Dairy was built. That has changed the um, uh, volume of sewage that's handled at the pump station and also um, created a need to expand the pump station for the future. So um, we have, as you'll recall from the uh, prior consideration you've given to this, a relatively more complicated situation than usual for this kind of a project because we have um, the State Agency of Transportation, um, the State uh, mm. Department of Buildings and General Services, the Federal Highway Administration, because it's an interstate highway welcome center, um, and the state um, agency of commerce and community development, because they are providing $100,000 of funding for the expansion part of this. So uh, with federal highway funds and uh, state highway funds, um, the state is funding the full cost of the renovation part of this project. And then with $100,000 from the Wyndham County Economic Development program, which is the um, uh, Entergy money that was um, committed for economic development here in Wyndham County. Um, $100,000 of that is being committed by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development for the expansion that creates the economic development opportunity for us uh, to assist in Commonwealth's growth. So um, what's before you this evening in order to move this forward are three separate actions. One is approving the uh, finance and maintenance agreement that's a um, mostly a standard form agreement um, between VTRANS and the town. Um, it has the additional element in this case to it of our agreement that um, at such time as we have received um, certification from the engineer that the project has been completed according to the specifications and 100% reimbursement for all of the project costs by the two state agencies, that at that point the town will take ownership of the, um, of the, the pump station uh, we'll have an easement granted to us by the state to be on the state property there and we'll own and operate the plant. We have operated the plant from the beginning or the, the uh, pump station from the beginning, um, but 
as a contractor to the state, we've always been reimbursed for the expenses that we've incurred there. And now we're actually going to own the facility because of the fact that um, the vast majority of the sewage that's being processed there or pumped through into the town's um, wastewater treatment system is um, coming from Brattleboro. So um, that's one agreement that we're asking you to approve this evening. It's been approved by all of the applicable staff as well as the um, attorneys for both the state and the town. Um, likewise, with the agreement between the town and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, which is a much simpler agreement that speaks to the $100,000 contribution for the expansion of the facility, um, and uh, the, the, it has some information in it re regarding the requirements of the um, WikiDip program, um, but primarily what is. is the Wyndham County <laughs> Economic Development Program, um, and and basically what that project, pro, pro, what that uh, agreement does is refer to the larger overall agreement and the overall scope of the project and then says um, the you know refers to the funding of the hundred thousand dollars and the town's obligation to um, uh, complete the project on behalf of the state and take over the, the project when it's finished and the third item before you is follow-up to action that you took on june 6th at our request uh, you'll recall that the most recent failure at the station occurred during late may the state declared an emergency at that time and um, authorized that there be um, expedited purchasing of the long lead time equipment items and asked the town to take on that responsibility so we could get that moving. You approved that emergency agreement that night to do the, just specifically that piece while the, these larger agreements were still being worked on. Um, and so since then, together with um, Otter Creek Engineering, who is the engineer for the project that was hired by the state, um, the uh, Department of Public Works has worked together with them to um, scope and price the three long lead time items, the pumps, the uh, emergency generator, and the switching equipment for the pump station. Um, so we're ready this evening for you to authorize um, those purchases, those orders be placed. Um, those, we expect it'll be about 12 weeks before that equipment will come in. During that 12 week period, if you approve the two agreements and the purchase of the long lead time items this evening, while we're waiting for the long lead time items to come in, uh, we will have time to put the specifications out on the street and do a proper competitive bidding process for the um, uh, hiring of the actual construction firm that'll do the work, um, and then be back late in the summer to ask that you award uh, that bid. We ex expect actually that the um, project will, um, bid, bid award would be able to happen um, in, um, towards the end of the summer and then actually the beginning of the fall um, and that the work will be completed by the end. It, oh. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I do. Um, so we're going to be taking this over. I mean, I know we've been working on it um, since day one, mm -hmm. um, but this worries me a little bit because now we're gonna be taking it over. Did they give us, I didn't read anywhere in here where they, they give us a, a a length of time that this one's going to last. Uh, so the expectation would be again on the order of 20 years. That's, 20 years. that's a reasonable expectation before there would need to be a rehabilitation performed on the pump station. So um, we're going to be eating that. And yes, but in during that 20 year period, we're also going to be receiving um, 250,000 gallons, up to 250,000 gallons a day, and the right. revenue that comes with okay. that for Good. the um, processing of what comes from Commonwealth. The, the reason that the state has looked to the town and the reason that in a prior decision mm -hmm. the select board indicated a willingness to take this on um, as a town facility as opposed to a town um, operation and maintenance right. of a state facility is because you know when it was originally constructed it was going to be um, predominantly to service the Welcome Center and uh, Algiers, Algiers. Right. area of Guilford along with a small section of Brattleboro. Right. Now the overwhelming majority of the volume of what passes through this pump station is coming from Brattleboro. Right. Well, I just wanted I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that we are going to be recouping something with you know Absolutely. on a yearly basis from uh, the sewage in the that's correct uh, in the working of that. So, yep. does anyone else have any questions? I don't. And I'm assuming the town attorney has looked over. He has. Agreement and says it's okay. Yes. Um, town staff, town attorney, state staff, and state attorneys all recommend approval. Okay, good. Um, does anyone in the public have any questions or comments on the pump, Welcome Center pump station? No. Very exciting topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so I guess we're ready to entertain a motion. Um, it's a long one, so I don't know who wants to read it. I'll make a motion. Uh, to authorize the town manager to, one, exec execute a finance and maintenance agreement between the state of Vermont and the town of Brattleboro. Two, execute a state of Vermont grant agreement between the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the town of Brattleboro. And three, proceed with the purchase of pumps, switching equipment, and an emergency generator as specified. And four, take any other actions necessary to complete the upgrade of the Welcome Center Pump Station Upgrade Project. Um, we have a motion to about the Welcome Center Pump Station Upgrade Project. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes 4-0. Um, next up is... Um, Rebuilding the Headworks conveyor at the wastewater treatment plant. Equally exciting. Uh, equally exciting. Exciting times. So um, the conveyor is um, in the early stage of treatment at the wastewater treatment plant. It's actually um, as material comes in to the plant, um, the conveyor removes um, grit and other um, solid debris from the wastewater that then um, continues on through the process uh, um, treatment at the plant. Um, this also is um, a, a refurbishment that is on schedule. Um, this one comes much quicker because of the daily extreme um, use that this conveyor gets. So um, it has handled approximately two and a half billion gallons of sewage during the four years, four and a half years that it's been operating there. Um, it was expected that in about the four year time frame, it would need to be um, uh, maintain, you know, a heavy maintenance would be done. What we're asking tonight is that in addition to doing the heavy maintenance that needs to be done just to keep everything functioning properly, um, the, that the, uh, this particular part of the facility be slightly modified in order to reduce the wear on the parts of the conveyor. So um, there are some bearings that they believe can be added to this system at a relatively low cost. Um, that will make it operate more efficiently and um, extend the life of the equipment. And so um, our ask is that um, Custom Conveyor Corporation, who installed the equipment, who would normally have been brought back um, at this time to do a you know, more routine maintenance on the system, um, be hired to do that routine maintenance and to uh, do the modification to the conveyor system for an overall total price of $29,882.95. Does anyone on the board have any comments or questions? Does that give us any more life in theory? Is that the theory behind the additional upgrade? Yes, it, it will. I, I can't quantify that for you, I'm sorry. Um, but it's, it's exactly its intent, is to um, allow the, right. it, it's a, it's a um, it takes a good beating, this equipment does, as the material flows into the plant. And, and the intent of the modification is to um, uh, make that a smoother operation that'll create less wear and tear on the physical equipment. <clears throat> okay. Um, one question I have is this was not a bid? Correct. Because um, it's the equipment that was installed by Custom Conveyor and again, they, you know, under more normal circumstances, we would just bring them back to do maintenance yeah. on their the equipment that they had installed. Um, we asked for a quotation from them of what the additional cost would be in order to do the improvement mm -hmm. to the facility, and so that's what's before you this evening. Okay, great. Anyone else on the board? I move to order. Oh, I want to ask the public. Oh. Does anyone in the public have well, any questions or comments about the wastewater treatment plants head works conveyor? No? Okay, John, well, just because I make a motion doesn't mean that people from the audience cannot participate That's true. afterwards. That's true. It's That's just true. getting the motion on the table, <laughs> Ms. Chair. Yes. <laughs> to award a contract in the amount of $29,882.95 to Custom Conveyor Corporation for rebuilding the Headworks conveyor at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we have a motion to award a contract in the amount of $29,882. And 95 cents to Custom Conveyor Corporation for rebuilding the Headworks conveyor at the wastewater treatment plant. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries 4-0. Um, we've got one last 
water and sewer, which is the Western Avenue water main over I-91. We were before you a few weeks ago and um, advised that that pipe is leaking. Um, if you've driven northbound on 91 under that bridge and taken a look to your right towards town as you go through, um, you can see the water that's flowing down the uh, abutment there. Um, and so it, this is a urgent replacement. Um, we discussed it thoroughly that evening. I'm not going to go back through all the details of the, the project except to say that um, the overall budget that um, we discussed with you and you approved for the FY18 um, utilities budget um, capital program is $460,000. Um, within that was um, funding for the engineering work of approximately 10% or $40,000. Um, we have a proposal from Dufresne Group to do the construction engineering services for $32,300, and we recommend your approval. Right. And this money is coming out of the utility budget, correct? That's correct. No. Yep. Um, and it, it is within that budget. The night that we talked about this um, you know, emerging situation that we needed to get at right away was the night when you were approving the um, utilities fund budget. budget. Yeah. Um, does anyone on the board have any questions or comments? Does anyone in the public have any questions or comments about the I-91 water main project? Would anyone like to make a motion? To approve a construction services agreement in the amount of $32,300 with Dufresne Group mm -hmm. <laughs> for engineering services to oversee the bidding and construction phases of the Western Avenue I-91 water main project. We have a motion to approve a construction services agreement in the amount of $32,300 with Dufresne Group to oversee the Western Avenue I-91 water main project. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries uh, four zero. Um, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn as water and sewer commissioners? So moved. We have a motion to adjourn as water and sewer commissioners. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, motion carries. We are convened as water and sewer, or are we adjourned, I'm sorry, as water and sewer commissioners. Um, we're going to move on to unfinished business and we're going to get our regular meeting update on the fire police facilities project you are going to have that regular <laughs> update um and this evening unlike many of the other updates we're also asking for a, um, substantial action from you to authorize us to proceed with um, several of the um, uh, purchases that are necessary in order to finish outfitting uh, the facilities um, so that they can be fully functional for the police and fire departments. Um, first, the update is everything's continuing to go along smoothly. There's no issues that have arisen that require any change orders or actions by the um, select board. Um, the police station is getting very nearly finished. We expect construction to be um, complete by early August. Um, about a 30-day process of moving in slowly into that facility so that the police department can uh, move you know, small units of the department one at a time into spaces and just keep fully functional throughout the time that they're uh, uh, moving into the new police station. Uh, we do expect that the entire police department will be located there and fully functional uh, by sometime in mid-September. We'll keep you posted as that process moves along. Um, at the central fire station, um, still on queue for a um, transition that's going to occur during August where the fire department um, operations there on site move around within the building into areas that have been uh, renovated or constructed um, so that the remainder of the building can be renovated in the finished uh, construction in the new section. So um, the expectation is still that that transition will occur during August and that the project will be finished uh, in November uh, and then the um, station by the end of November be, be uh, fully operational in its new uh, new condition. Um, on the authorization, administrative authorization of uh, certain small expenses, the only two things that I've authorized since the last report are electric bills uh, for the two sites from um, Green Mountain Power. Um, and then we have the request for authorization. So um, before 
going through those in, um, in detail, I want to just note that uh, where we currently stand um, financially on the project um, is we have a, a, in excess of $700,000 that is currently uncommitted. So uh, between the money that's actually been spent and the money that has already been um, uh, set aside for various contracts and purchases that have been authorized but um, not yet fully executed and fully paid for, um, the uh, from the uh, 13.8 million dollar uh, total, I'm sorry, 12.8 million dollar total uh, that we had available, um, that we've got 716 thousand sixty three dollars and seventeen cents left uncommitted. Of that, we're asking you to authorize 159 thousand three hundred and six dollars this evening for the following purposes: um, 99 thousand six hundred and seventy one dollars and fourteen cents for police station furnishings. These are um, a combination of, um, it, it's all anticipated. Uh, there was $80,000 budgeted for furnishings at the police station. Um, that, the, the list of things that that was uh, intended to buy is actually costing about $76,000. So we're coming in a little under budget for that, that set of um, uh, purchases. There's um, an additional $23,000 worth of equipment that was in the, the guaranteed maximum price for the contractor that we've determined can be more efficiently purchased separately directly by the town. And so it's been pulled out of the, the contract with the contractor. Uh, we recommend that that be included within this overall police furnishings purchase tonight. So this $100,000 rounded off um, is actually um, anticipated and budgeted. Um, the next item is um, $25,000 additional funding for Steve Horton's services as the owner's project manager. Um, I've explained in some detail in the written materials and I want to state here that um, Steve has saved the town much more money um, than he has cost the town in the execution of this project um, and in other work that he's done for us as well. So he's um, given the fact that we don't carry um, an engineering and um, construction management staff uh, as part of the town's um, uh, town employee staff. Um, it's important for us on a large complicated project like this to be able to rely on contracted expert um, services to represent our interests so um, that in the communication that occurs between the architect and the contractor and the subcontractors and the contractor and all the different things that go on with successfully executing projects of this scope and complexity, um, that there's somebody who is experienced in the construction industry who is the town's um, uh, representative in all of those um, dealings, both the, the more formal meetings that occur and in the um, general oversight of the project. Steve's done an excellent job with that, but we've leaned on him very heavily. Um, and so um, we, we find we're getting um, to the point we had $105,000 allocated for his services. Um, we're up into the 90s now and for what we've expended and given the fact that we've still got about um, five or six months left to go, um, we, we're gonna need some additional funding and we've estimated that $25,000 will be sufficient. So we are asking for an allocation not to exceed $25,000 so that the new upset figure for his overall engagement will be $130,000. Um, again, just on the purchase of the emergency generators alone, he saved the town between fifty and hundred thousand um, dollars. I know he's added a tremendous amount of value in smaller increments at all three of the facilities. Well, uh, I'd, along. I'd like to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> just so Steve. that's that's not a budgeted expense, Steve, but it is a needed expense. Getting. Yes. The other four items represent things that have been foreseen but not actually budgeted, so they will draw down on the un uncommitted funds. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they are things that are not um, popping up as surprises. It's just now become the time in the course of the mm -hmm. execution of the project when we need to make these purchases and install this equipment. And that's $20,192.25 for a dispatch center logging recorder, um, an amount not to exceed $20,000 for a variety of outfitting items in the two fire stations. Those are listed separately in the written backup materials. We can go through them in whatever level of detail you'd like to this evening, but it's a, a several small items, six or eight small items uh, that total $16,592 of cost to purchase, uh, but we don't have um, a shipping figure yet on all of those items. And so in order to allow some funds for shipping, we've asked for not to exceed $20,000. 
And then there's $7,914.99 for telephone cabling, a weather station, and a digital alarm master box at the police station, and $6,199.36 for new signage to relocate and to relocate a compressor at the central fire station. Those items are items that, um, had we not been bringing you the larger scale ask this evening, I would have just approved administratively. They're under ten thousand dollars, and they're it's equipment that's needed for the the uh, uh, to complete the projects. Um, but because we were assembling all of this material to bring to you this evening, um, it was timely, and so we included those on the list. Does anyone on the board have any questions, comments? Yeah, it's pretty detailed. I have one question. And I know they're really smart people, so I feel dumb even asking this question. Ask away. But they're going to have to move dispatch. Yes. So is there like a backup plan so when dispatch is being moved, there are other people yes. like answering the calls? In fact, um, well, it'll actually be our own dispatch, okay. so we'll keep answering the calls. Um, the One of the decisions that we made relatively early on was to put new equipment into the dispatch center rather than um, mm -hmm. move the the Assistant. dispatch That's equipment right. from here. The dispatch equipment here is old, um, and so it, it it has some useful life left, but not a lot of it, mm -hmm. so we would have been replacing it relatively soon anyway, mm -hmm. and it made the, the move both more cumbersome and more risky um, because of exactly that point. And so um, the dispatching operation will be able to continue downstairs until the very moment that there are dispatchers situated up at 62 Black Mountain Road ready to literally just take the baton and start dispatching from there. Okay. okay. I knew that there was a plan, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone in the public have any questions about the police fire facilities project update? <clears throat> would any, so would someone like to make a motion? To authorize the town manager to expend from the police fire facilities project bond fund $99,671.14 for police station furnishings, not to exceed $25,000 of additional funding for Steve Horton Services as owner's project manager, $20,192.25 for a dispatch center logging recorder, not to exceed $20,000 for a variety of outfitting items for the two fire stations. $7,914.99 for telephone cabling, a weather station and a digital alarm master box at the police station. And $6,199.36 for the new signage and to relocate a compressor both at the central fire station all as set forth more explicit, explicitly in the memorandum dated July 5th, 2017 from Town Manager Peter Elwell and in the attachments thereto. All right, we have a motion to authorize the Town Manager to expend money from the Police Fire Facility Project Bond Fund. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries 4-0. Now we're going to move on to setting the FY18 property tax rate. I hope John, are you going to speak to this one or oh, Peter? Speak to it. Okay. Um, then, if you'd like more information from John, he certainly can provide it regarding the calculations that are before you. Um, the uh, recommendation for a tax rate that's before you is driven by two things. One is the um, overall need for a certain amount of taxes to be collected in support of the FY18 budget. That was approved first by the select board and then by representative town meeting back in the late winter and uh, early spring. Um, but then the other factor that needs to be finalized before we can actually calculate a tax rate is the grand list. And that's a process that's ongoing through the spring um, gets completed by about the 1st of June, and then throughout the month of June, there are um, appeal hearings that are held by the, the Board of Listers uh, for, um, to listen to people who believe that um, their property should be valued at something less than uh, what the assessor's office believes it should be valued at. The listers make a final decision as to whether to uh, uphold the decision of the assessor's office or whether to make an adjustment um, in the value. When all of those decisions have been made, um, any adjustments that come out of that process, and there always are some, some years more than others, um, 
those adjustments are made to the grand list. Um, everything is double checked one final time. Um, and then the assessor's office does what's called lodging the grand list, which is the official um, transmittal of the grand list for the coming fiscal year um, via the, the uh, town clerk's office. At that point, we know the value of property in town, the taxable value of property, and we know how much we need to collect in taxes. And you do the math and it identifies what the tax rate is that needs to be applied against um, all of the taxable value of the property in town. I'm happy to report that the results of that process this year have come in a little better than what we were um, forecasting at the time that the select board approved the budget back in January. It might have been early February, but I think it was late January. Um, and, uh, and better than what we represented to town meeting when it approved the budget on March 25th. You'll recall that um, on those dates, we um, had um, anticipated that the um, amount of the increase this year would be three and a half cents on the tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually coming in at 3.07 cent increase. Um, because there has been a small increase in the uh, grand list, um, it allows for a smaller uh, tax rate increase upon all of the properties in order to collect the amount of taxes that are needed to fund the FY18 budget. Um, so um, on, a, on a year when we have taken on the additional debt uh, for the uh, police fire um, facilities project um, and when we in the first um, estimate of what it would cost to carry on with town business uh, and take on that additional debt load, uh, our first estimate was a, a 6.8 cent mm -hmm increase in the tax rate um, that was pretty quickly moved down to about five cents but then we did the work that we did together with the prior select board around last year's budget uh, moved it further down from the five to the uh, three and a half uh, level and um, what's before you to be approved tonight would be a 3.07 cent increase so um, what that translates to in real dollars um, because of that that those numbers i was just describing are specific to the municipal portion of the tax rate but there's of course the education portion that is even slightly larger and is dictated by the state on that uh, part of the calculation this year there's actually a reduction in the tax rate and so the two combined for the total taxes that will be levied for property owners in brattleboro um, for um, homes that, that are uh, actually homesteaded uh, <coughs> properties, um, for every $100,000 of value on such properties, there'll be a $6.38 tax increase this year. Um, and for non-residential property, for every $100,000 of value, there'll be a $0.28 cent tax increase this year. We not only recommend your approval, but I guess it's appropriate for me to advise you that um, you we have, have a have responsibility to. at this point <laughs> to adopt this tax rate or else we won't have sufficient taxes we to, have to. to fund government this year. Yeah. And it is important to remember that this is based on the budget that was passed in town meeting right. in March. And one thing I just want to explain to people on the front, there's a front cover memo, there's the DID assessment, mm -hmm. and for people that I don't know in the world who don't know what that is. The, the DID is downtown, and there's a special assessment not on everybody in town, but only on the people that own property downtown. And that money is given to the designated downtown organization, which in our case is Downtown Brattleboro Alliance. That's correct. And that the total amount of that this year is $75,000. Thank you for that. I, I should have pointed that out, and I also should have pointed out there's one other special feature to this, which is the Tri Park. Um, uh, assessment which relates to the um, capital improvements that were made um, within the mobile home park there several years ago um, and where there was an agreement between the town and Tri Park um, there's a formula by which it's calculated it's not strictly speaking a property tax it's actually um, an, an assessment on those properties but it is calculated based on the property value at the park um, and so that calculation is also shown in these materials and in the motion that we're asking you to approve here in a moment you will you know a, port, a part of what you'll read there and a part of what you'll adopt um, will relate to that assessment as well does anyone have any questions comments does anyone in the public have any questions about the municipal tax rate all right would anyone like to make a motion to approve a municipal tax rate of 1.2214 per $100 of assessed valuation 
for general fund operations, an additional .1294 per $100 of assessed valuation for the Downtown Improvement District, and an additional 6.8785 per $100 of assessed valuation for the Tri-Park Special Assessment and to ratify the state mandated education rates at 1.5976 per $100 of assessed valuation for homestead properties and 1.4557 per $100 of assessed valuation for non-residential properties. Thank you. We have a motion to set the municipal tax rate and also the downtown improvement district special assessment and the tri park special assessment and the education fund. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 4 0. Whew, John, you were sweating that one, were you? <laughs> um, next up is the farm tax stabilization program. I'm assuming our That'll town be me again. Talk about that. And um, before I do that, actually, just related to the last item, I want to also acknowledge, actually, he was here just a moment ago, um, Ru Russell Rice. Um, I hadn't seen when we began that discussion. Yeah, I, I knew John was here. Russell was here. I believe he's just left because his item has just been approved. <laughs> and there he is now. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge <laughs> Russell and his team in the assessor's office who um, are coming up for air now because <laughs> the last few months have been especially intense to make sure that all of that work that I described a few minutes ago to get the uh, grand list finalized and get through the hearings and um, do all of the adjustments necessary got done in a timely manner so that you could be approving the tax rate tonight and uh, the bills can go out. Now it becomes, uh, the handoff occurs and the finance department gets very busy with shooting those bills out over the next few days um, so that we can receive the first round of payments on August 15th, so thank, thank you. you. Um, Farm tax stabilization um, is a program that is intended to preserve the actively farmed lands in Brattleboro. Um, there are several um, farms that are still in um, active agricultural use. Um, one of those is the Rob family farm. And um, there's provisions, because this provides tax relief to the owners and operators of these farm uh, properties, um, there are some rules that the, the uh, um, beneficiaries of the program have to follow, one of which is that um, at least two-thirds of the income for the household has to be um, provided by the farming activity on the land. Um, the Robs are in transition in the ownership of the farm. Um, um, from a generational transition that's happening there, and so um, their um, family finances are such that for the last couple of years, um, the farm hasn't quite reached 67% of, of their income, although it still is providing a very substantial amount of the household income. More important in terms of the um, philosophical basis for the program and the community value of providing this tax relief, um, the land there is not only continuing to be actively farmed, but actually um, they've expanded and diversified um, uh, how the, the uh, uh, farm is, um, how they're using the land and how they're generating income from it. So, um, so we have a process that we follow when um, a situation like this arises where um, the owners can ask the town to review the situation. There's a private review of their financial information that's conducted in order to keep that information private. Um, but then it is up to the chair of the select board and the town manager and the finance director to advise the full select board as to whether or not we think that um, the uh, folks who've asked for a waiver are entitled to it. Um, in, in this instance, we do believe that and so we unanimously are asking the select board tonight to grant the waiver for FY18 to the, the Rob family farm. Does anyone on the board have any questions or comments? This is a waiver that I gladly do. Yeah. All right, does anyone in the public have any questions or comments about tax stabilization for the Rob family farm? Would someone like to make a motion? Sure. To approve the continued participation of the Rob family farm in the farm tax stabilization program for fiscal year 2018. Okay, we have a motion to approve the continued participation of the Rob Family Farm in the Farm Tax Stabilization Program for FY18. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Um, Next up is we're going to award a bid for a paving program. 
we received three bids um, in the right location by the deadline um, for the uh, capital paving program for this year. Um, Mitchell Sand and Gravel of Winchester, New Hampshire is the low bidder at $146,178.50. That's a really good price. Um, we had estimated $250,000 for this work. Um, and in fact, one of the three bids came in slightly higher than that figure. Uh, the other two were lower and um, the lowest of those is Mitchell Sand and Gravel. So um, we're happy to recommend that you authorize us to enter into a contract with Mitchell Sand and Gravel of Winchester, New Hampshire for $146,178.50 to complete the um, uh, FY18 capital paving program. Okay, and that's for Frost Place, Willow Street, William Street, Washington Street, Black Mountain Road. Tara Street, Bradley Ave, and Tyler Street. Is correct. That correct. Yes. Peter, have we used Mitchell before? Um, I'm not personally familiar with Mitchell Sand and Gravel, but um, Public Works is and felt completely comfortable making this recommendation. Well, I'm just wondering why it's so low. I mean, uh, they actually produce their own. They're they're an asphalt plant, right? As well as an asphalt. Um, so paving no company markup. and right. so um, if you compare the details of the bids we received mm. almost the entire um, difference between these bids can be accounted for in the Purchase lower right. price of, of the yep. material good does anyone board have any questions or comments we should use them a lot does anyone in the public have any questions or comments about the capital paving project no. Right. Would anyone like to make Doesn't a motion? Get more exciting than this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make a motion to award the FY18 capital paving contract to Mitchell Sand and Gravel in the amount of one hundred and forty-six thousand one hundred and seventy-eight dollars and fifty cents. We have a motion to award the FY18 capital paving project to Mitchell Sand and Gravel. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries four zero. Now we got the skateboarders yeah, here. Next up is we have a few items um, dealing with the state skateboard park. First up um, is a status report. Could tell them <laughs> Small applause. Hello. 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 Hey, Jeff. Hello. How are you? Great. How are we doing? Doing pretty well. Good. Staying on task, but Good. doing pretty well. Excellent. Um, so first off, I do want to mention that uh, we are receiving a lot of positive remarks when we're out at Gallery Walk. So Good. people are happy to know where it is about the overall facility of Liberty Memorial Park, what they're having accessibility to. So positively, you know, the, the, the remarks are coming in and we're happy about that. So just to review, uh, um, <clears throat> the overall budget uh, for the skate park is $230,000 and that's based on $46 a square foot for 5,000 square feet. Uh, we presently have $106,000. That includes $35,000 in pledges. So we essentially need $124,000. Um, as you know, we've applied for a $25,000 uh, recreation facilities grant from the Vermont Department of Buildings and General Services. Uh, and we also have previously applied for a $45,000 uh, grant from TD uh, Bank that has been submitted. Um, we have an event coming up. Uh, it's called uh, it's VT Stance. It's a car club. Uh, they're a nonprofit car club based out of Guilford, Vermont. Uh, their goal is to spread awareness and appreciation of local car scene and to provide a meeting space for those in the area who are passionate about cars. Uh, the, the event is called Down and Out 3. This is the third year they're holding this event. Last year, uh, they had about 400 cars come and go throughout the day. Um, this event is going to be uh, on August 19th from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock on a Saturday. And uh, the majority of the proceeds are coming to BASIC. They're holding this event and the proceeds are becoming to us. Uh, it'll be at the high school. They've already worked out um, the, the location and all the responsibilities fall to them, but we're there to support them. Uh, there's going to be awards for best of VIP, best in show. There's going to be a, an exhaust and a limbo contest for your car. So it should be fun. Um, and then there's also going to be parts and food vendors on site. 
Um, we're also working on events uh, for the fall. Uh, Sunrise Rotary um, have reached out to us for their trivia uh, partner event. Um, so essentially what we're trying to say is, you know, it's, to the public, it's, it's time, time to give, tax deductible. And there's three ways to give, of course. Um, you caring, we have this great video up there describing who we are, what we're about, and, and where we are in the project. Uh, you can go to you caring, you can cut a check also to the Brattleboro um, uh, Rec and, uh, Recs and uh, Parks Department, or you can go to brattleboroskatepark.com and uh, donate online. Don't know if you have uh, any questions. For the love of God, folks, contribute <laughs> to this. Uh, in, my, in my lifetime, I want to see this thing built. Second. My <laughs> God, this has been forever. So I, I'm going to go out with signs and let's make it happen and make it happen captain so yeah i yeah. used this joke before but let's make a skate park not a wheelchair park so. uh -huh. yeah 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 46 uh, percent of the way there you know? i know i know but it's so we still have you know we've got the two grants that we're applying for knock on wood they'll that'll get us to about 75 percent of the way there mm -hmm. around that level is where we want to go out to get the design and that will that will be an overall stakeholder design the designer comes in, holds three meetings, one, everyone brainstorming, what would you like to see, all of that. They compile that, come back for meeting number two. They then say, okay, this is what the concept brings. Let's line strike stuff, let's adjust accordingly. Come back for the third design, this is what you guys get. But it's a great process when you go through right. it. But we want to get around that 75% before we, we right. go through that process. Now when will you know about the two larger grants? In the fall. Okay, so it's not too much longer. Okay. So, so for all the people that didn't want it at Crow Lot and in your, in your backyard, <laughs> it's now at Living Memorial Park. It's time to pay the piper. <laughs> it's time to, let's get on board with this. I do have to say, some of the group around Good. the Crow Lot Good. have contributed. Good. And we right. thank any and all. Absolutely. Absolutely. But. Yep. <laughs> well, I want to try skateboarding before I die, so I, I, I need a place to do it. <laughs> so. Um, all right, who wants to talk to us about the grants that we're, hope we're going to apply for tonight? Sure. There's um, one actually that you're um, okay, accepting, accepting and appropriating, uh, $1,400 from the Crosby Gannett Fund uh, of the Vermont Community Foundation. And then uh, we are asking for permission to apply for a $25,000 recreational facilities grant from the Vermont um, Department of Buildings and General Services. And were there any other possibilities yeah. for grants out there? I mean, I, I know you guys have worked tirelessly on this, so. There's a large one from the conservation fund. Um, what we missed the last application period because we were still in limbo with our permitting. Right. And so now the next application won't be until 2018 for the fiscal year of 2019. So if we can stay on track of building this next year like we want to, then that won't be an option for us. And how much is that one for? It could be up to up to 100,000 maybe. Oh, wow. Man. Well, hopefully we can start building next year. That would be the really nice thing to start, you know, break ground in 2018. Right. That's what we're really Oriented. But to, to get to that, you need 75? Well, it, it would be nice. To be responsible. Right. As a committee, as a group, you kind of don't want to do it shorthandedly before you reach that cusp. And you actually use that as donation sources. You say, yeah, here it is. Here's the final product. Right. You know, there's all the stakeholders, the neighbors, the skaters, right. you know, the moms of the world. They, they voted and said, yeah, this is what we want. Right. Well, I got to give you guys credit. You put a lot of work into this, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. uh, would somebody like to make a motion so we can accept and approve and apply? I'll make a motion uh, to accept and appropriate a $1,400 grant from the Crosby Gannett Fund of the Vermont Community Foundation and to authorize application for a $25,000 recreational facilities grant from the Vermont Department of Buildings and General Services both to provide funding for the future construction of a skate park in the upper section of Living Memorial Park. We have a motion to, an ex to accept and appropriate a grant from the Crosby Gannett Fund and to apply for a grant 
from the Vermont Department of Buildings and General Services. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <clears throat> no. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. We hope you. next time you come back, you can tell us you got all kinds of money. <laughs> Um, the next item on the agenda is a discussion about um, panhandling in um, Brattleboro, and this came up um, a couple weeks, or maybe months ago or something, when we were talking about our um, goals and what we wanted to talk about for the next year, and Tim brought up the panhandling issue. Um, so what we want to do tonight, and I'm going to invite, we have special guests um, to come up to the table. We have Michelle Simpson Siegel, um, who's the from the downtown group, Downtown Brattleboro Alliance. Josh Davis is with Groundworks and Chief Fitzgerald of the Brattleboro Police Department. Um, but first, I'm going to have, you know, Tim, you can talk to us about why you wanted to um, sure. bring this up. And yeah. then we'll have our special guests come in and tell us what they've been doing. Thank you, thank you. I thought I would just uh, say a few words because, um, well, I was sort of one of the ones that, to move this uh, discussion along, and uh, as a candidate, I was getting a lot of comments from some merchants, and uh, they wanted to see this brought up again. It has been discussed in the past by the select board, but I think it's worth uh, taking another look at. Uh, I did write a few notes just because I figured I would go off and I'll try to edit myself a little bit, but I'll, I'll say a few things up front and just uh, hold back on too many comments later. Um, so, oh, it's a crowd coming. Oh no, it's the skateboarders. <laughs> they're excited. They're still excited. <laughs> That's fine. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so, uh, any of you who know me, uh, it's no secret that I think Brattleboro is a really great town. Um, it's the reason, I'm sure, why all of us up here uh, are here for the town. Uh, it's the reason why all of these great people are here tonight and, and all of our staff um, that work really hard for this town. And I think uh, we need to recognize on a broader perspective that, that Brattleboro really has the same kinds of challenges that a lot of towns in this uh, country do, and a lot of towns and cities, as is evidenced by the opioid, opioid crisis that we're struggling with as well. Um, one of these challenges uh, to some of our residents and working people and downtown merchants is panhandling. So regardless of your personal opinion on the topic of someone standing downtown with or without a sign asking for money, it's enough of a legitimate concern to enough of our community that I think we as a select board should try once again to get it, to give it some attention. Uh, I wanted to kind of make things, a couple of things really clear and then we'll, we'll start to the discussion. I think we all fully recognize that there's a huge amount of backstory to this uh, issue. There's a lot of reasons why panhandling exists. Uh, and there are societal issues, from anywhere from not enough jobs, uh, the causes of homelessness, uh, our health care crisis, uh, drug use, mental health crisis. So we all get the fact that there's quite a bit of societal factors bleeding into this issue that comes down to, you know, this is just one of our symptoms of larger issues. Um, and we're not going to address those larger issues here tonight, but what we're trying to do is come up with some Brattleboro solutions to uh, some issues that are, that are especially our merchants have. Um, so I'd love to discuss concrete, real-world ideas to help how to lessen the frequency and disruptiveness of panhandling downtown. Um, what I hope we are not going to be doing tonight is being disrespectful towards people who engage in panhandling for a wide variety of reasons. I'd like to approach this issue with compassion, uh, both for our neighbors we see on the streets and for our neighbors who are the merchants who keep our downtown vibrant. Um, spoiler alert, we will not be enacting any rules against panhandling tonight. Uh, in talking to many people about this issue, I've realized that a lot of people don't know that we already have a, uh, what is known as an anti-begging ordinance in this mm -hmm. town, but it's unenforceable because asking for, s for money from someone down on the streets is a First Amendment right, mm -hmm. and we believe in free speech. So 
I also wanted to ask people to keep in mind that this issue is so layered that it's easy to start talking about it. It's happened to me already. Um, and realize you're going off topic so completely that you're pushing into related topics that are really bothering you, like homelessness, opioid addiction, all topics, topics as I said, that feed into this problem. So uh, tonight we're kind of just looking for real solutions uh, in the perceived increase in panhandling, and a lot of people have expressed that to me, that some of us are concerned with. And finally, I just wanted to remind people that while asking for people for money is legal, harassment and intimidation is not legal. Uh, and that behavior should always be reported to the police immediately. So let's try to be careful and keep this discussion of the very legal act of panhandling and the real steps that we can take. And uh, I think in that spirit of just making a great town even greater and finding some uh, good solutions and hearing some concerns for our community, I think we should just go forward. Are we going to perhaps look at panelists? Yeah. Is that what we call them? Panel panelists. What, what I thought just for people in the public is we're going to um, hear from the people Josh and Michelle and Chief Fitzgerald have really been sort of on the streets, I don't want to say it that way, but you've been really on the forefront of working on this issue. So we thought it'd be helpful for all of us to hear from people who have been dealing with this, some people on a daily basis. And then we're going to open up to the public for comments and concerns and we can have um, a discussion. I do want to just echo what Tim said is we're going to try really hard to keep this on the panhandling issue. So I may remind people if you start wandering, like let's bring it back. Um, cause Cause she really, has your gavel ready. my gavel. That's sort of where we want to be tonight. So I guess I'll turn it over to you folks. If you want to introduce yourselves again. And sure. go. Should I, should I begin? Sure. Um, I'm Michelle Simpson. I'm the president of the Downtown Brattleboro Alliance, uh, which represents the building owners, the business people, and also the residents in the Downtown Improvement District. So it's not just the business community. It's also the people who live in the DID. Um, I've had uh, the great pleasure of working with um, these gentlemen on the panel and then also with the select board to begin to really brainstorm some concrete solutions. Um, and one sort of action item that we are engaging in is the Chamber and the Downtown Alliance is going to collect some data from the merchants and the residents downtown, so stay tuned for that, to really get um, some numbers, if we can, about the frequency of panhandling and or harassment. We get a lot of anecdotes um, because this is such an issue that hits home for so many people. It's, uh, it's quite a moral issue, spiritual issue, if you will. Um, and so that's one thing that we are beginning to do. And I'm going to let Josh and Chief Fitzgerald talk about some of their action items, too. We also have some literature for you guys to take for anybody who's interested, um, just about what other cities are doing, because we are looking at other models. Um, and then also um, just really looking at uh, the issue from many different facets. So. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I'm Josh Davis. I'm executive director of Groundworks Collaborative. We operate uh, two different homeless shelters, one seasonal, one year round. We have case management services and a drop-in center. And so I'd like to thank uh, the select board for hosting this conversation tonight. You know, a quick Google search about panhandling will show you that we're not unique in having this discussion as a town. This conversation is going on throughout the country as we speak, ordinances and uh, programs are being tried and piloted um, you know, this summer, uh, and it goes back uh, last few years. So we do have choices and options in terms of strategies and solutions. In response to, you know, we, the three of us uh, authored an article that was in the Commons, um, and it was just serendipitously followed a, a conversation in town about panhandling. And so in preparation, or in response to that, and also preparation for this meeting, Groundworks case managers designed and delivered a survey to get more information in hopes of grounding this conversation about panhandling. We were able to connect with 11 people and got responses from eight individuals. It's 
really too small to be uh, statistically significant, but I think in terms of helping to bring some shape uh, to this conversation, it's worth uh, going through a couple of the responses. The responses were from people that we knew who uh, identified as panhandling. We did not walk around on a particular day and uh, interview people that just happened to be on the street. Um, and so, results of the survey, most were homeless or housing insecure. Uh, housing insecure being sleeping on a friend's couch. Uh, panhandling, in, as they report, is not lucrative. Average was about $20 a day. Uh, people reported using the money to purchase a variety of items, including food, beer, cigarettes, phones, drugs, socks, and camping gear. There were a range of experiences reported from interaction with the public, from kind and sympathetic to unkind and unsympathetic. Most reported limited or no natural supports to fall back on. That would be friends or family. There was near unanimous uh, supportive response uh, and interest for work if there were an opportunity. And it wasn't a direct question on the survey, but in the survey, no one reported enjoying uh, or even liking panhandling, and, and very much to the contrary of reporting that uh, it's, they don't like it at all. I have copies of that. We're not quite prepared uh, to release it, but we will, and I'm happy to share that information because there's more questions and more responses on there, and I think it's really interesting. So again, examples of how communities have responded range from ordinances like we have on the books here in Brattleboro, or a sit-lie ordinance that was recently passed in Saratoga Springs, which says no individual may sit down or lie down on the sidewalk or other public spaces. Ordinances are very hard to police, uh, and they're not very effective in curbing uh, behaviors. Other communities, uh, are trying to make it easy for people to give to organizations such as Groundworks Collaborative as opposed to giving money directly to people on the street that are asking for it. In Orlando, there are parking meters and uh, parking areas that take donations. Burlington has collection boxes uh, decorated by local artists. And in Philadelphia, I just learned today, they recently started an initiative that allows people to text donations uh, using their smartphones. And those donations are actually matched by the city there. I think one of the things that I've seen in response to this issue that I'm most excited about is what's going on in uh, Portland, Maine, uh, also in Chicago and Albuquerque, which is they offer folks that are asking for money on the street a job for the day, typically around beautifying public spaces uh, in exchange for a day's wage and food. Um, I think it's really innovative to take this need, get this need met in a win-win situation, both for the town itself and also the individual who is uh, trying to meet the needs that they have at hand. Also, those programs uh, connect folks to services and potentially permanent job situations. So just a couple of thoughts to share. Thanks. I'm Mike Fitzgerald, the Brattleboro Police Chief, and uh, like Tim, I wrote some notes down because as I started thinking about about this issue, uh, there are so many variables and so many moving parts that I even had trouble in my office trying to stay on track exactly what we're looking at. You know, the, uh, the opiate epidemic we're experiencing now, the mental health issues and everything else, it, 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 all, it all plays a part. So it, it, I'm gonna refer to my notes and I apologize right up front because I do wanna stay on track. Um, when looking at the, the panhandle issue, um, I was thinking, okay, what, what, what's the underlying issues here? That's the way we're going to correct this, okay? That's the way we're going to, to really help people out is by addressing the underlying issues. And to do that, I was thinking more lines of, and this is not original, this happens a lot. Uh, there's a plethora of information on the internet about an outreach team. And that outreach team would consist of a police officer, a mental health provider, a recovery specialist, and maybe even a, a volunteer that formerly was a panhandler. And that volunteer could help the team identify with, with the struggles that the homeless and the panhandlers are facing and offer, offer personal antidotes on how, how can we help this person? How can they relate? Uh, 
The team would be responsible for handling issues that deal with the panhandling population and to build relationships while informing them of the various resources and assistance that is available to them and uh, with the goal of making them self-sufficient again and improving the quality of life for everyone downtown, the residents, the business owners, uh, the community at large. The, the goal would be to provide, uh, once again, referrals and services, but as a, a part of a long-term approach. We're not going to solve this in a month or, or, or two. It's, this is going to be a long-term approach uh, to assist those in needs. But the overarching goal of the outreach team would be to focus on improving the quality of life for everybody in the, in the community. And to start off with, we're, we're looking at um, okay, where the, where's the personnel going to come from from on this? Where's the funding going to come from? How is it going to be uh, staffed and organized? Uh, initially, what we can do is I will ask these different agencies and organizations if they would be willing to donate, if you will, or volunteer an individual, one of their, their specialists and experts in that field. Uh, for a few hours a week, uh, you know, once a week, twice a week, whatever they can spare. I will most certainly make an officer available to go with them um, when they go out and to make contact. And then it can become more formal as we find out where we need to concentrate, uh, where our, our weaknesses are, how can we shore those up. Once we get down and run in, talk to other agencies that actually have experience with these outreach teams, um, learn from them and on how we best can do it. And then ultimately, it should fall under a, a social service agency that handles this because it basically that's that's where a lot of these services come from. And with a with a law enforcement component. And take it from there, it's it's what I was thinking about. Um, we're going, we're going to try it. I'm, I'm going to reach out to the different agencies to see what we can do and just basically go downtown. Uh, no set time. Just walk around, talk to these people, get to know them and say, hey, what do you need? What's what's going on? How can we help you? And and see if that will help in conjunction with what Michelle and Josh are also proposing. So it's kind of a, a multi-prong uh, tactic here that hopefully we can see some positive results. And we'd love to hear from the members of the community if, if you have some ideas on what we should do. Yeah, thank And I, I would just like to share uh, one last little sort of bit about the spectrum of the issue that, you know, I'm here representing the Downtown Alliance. So that's, again, merchants, building owners, and residents. So I have many merchants who have communicated how uh, this negatively affects their business and of course we're all interested in a very vibrant downtown at the same time I had residents approach me just today saying I wish I could be there tonight I don't mind panhandling I give to everyone so again even just within one organization the downtown Alliance we have a spectrum of perspectives on it um, but I don't want to underscore, uh, uh, minimize the impact that panhandling has on our downtown businesses. It is significant. You'll probably hear from um, some merchants tonight. Um, and the again, the safety concerns. We've had different, there's varying uh, experiences out there, which we want to hear more about, which it's hard to quantify those experiences, right? That's where we're going to attempt to do a survey to quantify, but experiences tend to be much more anecdotal. It's hard to get numbers of individuals' experiences, but we have had many um, anecdotes submitted of people actually being harassed and unsafe as well. So there's a spectrum of viewpoints on people, how they view panhandling, there's a spectrum of viewpoints on people who do panhandle, you know, and how they approach it. Josh submitted eight, you know, people's responses, yeah. responses. again, small sample size. Um, 
So it's a very uh, detailed issue. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from the select board and from everyone who's here um, so that we can address this uh, as productively and compassionately as we can and effectively. Great. Well, thank you for being here. Um, and I hope you'll stay right where you are so when we have our discussion. Um, if the board doesn't have any objection, what I thought I would do is open the floor oh, up absolutely. to the public so yeah. we can hear from no, the public. Um, what I would ask is um, when you come to the microphone, if you can say who you are, we'd appreciate that. Um, and keep your remarks as concise as possible so we can have more people can speak and we'll make a more fluid discussion. Hi there. My name is Chad Simmons. I'm a resident here in Brattleboro. Uh, I also serve as the Regional Council Coordinator for Building Bright Futures. We're the Early Childhood Council for our region. Um, and I mention that because I realize and recognize that we do want to keep the conversation around strictly panhandling. Um, but one of the areas that we're focused on is ensuring that our economy works for all families. And the key, key word is all. And um, what that's led me to do in my role as the council coordinator is to really think about what that means. And so I, I think about that. And the question that comes to mind is, who is our economy for? Is it for tourists? Is it for residents? Or is it for all of us? Um, and so that's how I approach my job in ensuring that uh, families want to live here, stay here, raise their kids here. Um, and I, that's how I've been thinking about this issue, is who is our economy for? And that question's been driving a lot of my involvement in this particular issue. But more broadly, how do we look at the root causes of um, why people are on the streets uh, flying a sign? And, uh, and asking for money. Um, so I, I encourage the select board, I encourage the folks in the community to think of two things um, and keep that one question in mind, who is the economy for? Uh, one is to uh, don't hide from the, the big picture. Um, I know it seems very overwhelming, but I think um, there's a couple of things we can do. We can better understand root causes of poverty um, and, and why these issues exist. We can also better understand our relationship with money and with poverty and income inequality. Um, and we'll be comfort more comfortable talking about it um, in these settings. Um, the other is I think uh, some really creative solutions have been um, already suggested tonight. And I really suggest that the, the town, uh, along with partnering agencies, businesses, residents, uh, service providers, look at this as a collaborative opportunity to try something out. Um, I think we have a great opportunity to look at how we can improve our local economy um, through this issue. So um, I thank you for this conversation. I really appreciate you um, calling the, uh, allowing the select board to kind of have this conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to <coughs> comment or as a question? Yes, sir. Please come right up. My name is Tom Zoff. I uh, live in Brattleboro, and I'm not from here. People are always saying, well, you know, some of these people aren't from here. And I said, well, how many people in this room are from here? <laughs> well, that's usually a majority aren't from here. But it's a wonderful town we live in. And I'm one of these people that I uh, usually have a $5 bill here. It's handy. I don't open up my billfold on the street and so on. And uh, yes, I give money to panhandlers. And I usually ask them, uh, what's your situation? I don't say, what's your story? I say, what's your situation? Just to hear, well, you know, why are they here, why are they there? And uh, <clears throat> also, I'm a supporter of Groundworks, and I serve on the board. Uh, because of my interest in this situation. And uh, being a stranger here in Brattleboro, I've only lived here for a couple of years. I've lived in Dummerston before that, and we don't have this problem in Dummerston. And I don't really look at it as a problem. It's just part of the community. You're going to have some people who don't have uh, 
income, they don't have a home, they don't have places to stay, but they're still our neighbors. And uh, so I encourage these kind of meetings and the work that Groundworks is doing and sometimes I can refer people and help them out. And I had the nice occasion two days ago of a young man who was getting service from these agencies and who I had helped out a couple times a few years ago who said now he's settled down, he's got a place to stay and his life has improved and so on. And he just said, I just want to thank you. And he wasn't panhandling, he just was thanking me for the panhandling that he had done in the past. Uh, so it's, it's an issue which is something that's happening to our neighbors. And what can we do to help them and to help other people want to help them? Thank you very thank much. You. Um, is there anyone else in the public? <clears throat> that would like to make a comment or make a suggestion or say anything? All right, I think what I heard um, from the panel is that there are four suggestions. I thought I'd just run through them. Um, a survey, which as Michelle said, the Downtown Alliance, and I'm on the chamber, so the chamber <laughs> is willing to send out to, to get a feel from people about what their, what their experience is. Um, and what you know situations they find themselves in, and that would be to not only merchants but residents of downtown, um, and the chamber can help with the general public and just seeing if you go downtown, what's your experience. So I think the it's getting a wide enough circulation so we can get some data. Um, Josh talked about the um, jobs. Jobs program and the collection box, which is, are two possibilities that mm -hmm. we can discuss. And the chief talked about the um, outreach task force, which it sounds like you're gung-ho to take charge of. I don't want to put that on you, but will well, definitely help. take lead. Yes, yep. take lead. I'll put it on him. <laughs> yeah. Yep, she um, will. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Take the lead. So I don't know what um, um, people um, on the select board think about that or other things that you'd like to see come out of this. It's a tough topic to talk about. And, and I'll give you a couple experiences um, that I've had and my wife has had. You know, it's the problem is you want to be compassionate. And, and you want to help out, but on the other hand, so my wife does a um, flower class every Wednesday at Taylor for Flowers, and it's usually around 5 or 5.30. And she's been, you know, and I don't want to use the word accosted, but really, really pressured um, in between her car and going into the store. And it's like, that's not the town that, you know that that I want to have out there uh, in the perception of it. So it's, but again, I, I this is this is a giant onion. There's so many layers to this thing that it's a, uh, you know, it's it's like the diversity issue also. I mean, there's a lot to it. It's just not, you know, okay, let's let's ban it or let's let's get rid of it. Um, it's not going to happen. So. I, I have a little bit of a, a the the negative side of of the panhandling issue. And, and the one question that I always ask myself, and it, it, when you went out and did your study, I, you know, I appreciate the studies, but what person is going is really going to say, hey, why do you panhandle? Oh, I panhandle because I, yeah, I'm, I'm buying drugs. They're not going to tell you the, you know, the complete truth on that. They actually oh, said, yeah, they buy drugs. <laughs> oh, and I said that they reported they buy drugs. <laughs> yeah, I know, I saw, I saw that in your list of things and I went, you know, that's, that's great that whoever that person was, it was that forthcoming. But um, I don't think the majority of the people would would be that, um, you know, forthcoming. Um, so, you know, studies like that are are always hard. But um, it, it is it's a tough tough subject, and uh, you know, and I I did I did the Google search today, uh -huh. and there's. 500 pages. I mean, you could go on forever. And I noticed that Bennington had an ordinance. Uh, Rutland tried an ordinance. Um, Chittenden County, I think there was four in the state of Vermont that tried to do some kind of an ordinance. Um, 
for me, I mean, I I would like to see an ordinance where there's, um, you know, where there you take away that harassment issue. You take away that, you know, and and that, and I I know we have that, but I don't know how to in, how to really enforce that. And, um, and again, I'm trying to stay on topic here, so no, so stay with me. Um, you know, so again, I, I just think it's going to be a collaboration with with everybody. I don't like to see. I don't like to see it. I don't think it's, you know, it, it gives Brattleboro a good impression. Uh, you know, of the kind of town we are. And the other thing I always think about is that, um, it, and again, it's like on the diversity thing. I, I've never panhandled. I, I don't. I've never been in that position, so I can't empathize with people that have to panhandle. Right. I, I just haven't. Um, so, you know, that's that's where it it gets. And there was another point I was going to try to make, and it went right out. It well, went right out the window. Well, while you're thinking about it, can yep. I ask the chief to address something that you yeah. just talked about? Yeah. Would you like to sort of explain to people when panhandling goes over mm -hmm. the edge and where they when they should call the police? That might be instructive for people. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that's good. Thank you. Um, basically, when it gets aggressive is when it becomes illegal. An individual standing there with a sign, uh, an individual you know, asking you as you walk by, uh, that's that's freedom of speech, and and that's well within their their constitutional right to do that. Where it becomes aggressive panhandling is if they block you, if they certainly put their hands on you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, loud, uh, tumultuous behavior, uh, the profanity, screaming, uh, things of that nature. By all means, please uh, call, the, call the police because we can arrest them under, under the disorderly conduct statute. Also, if uh, it's, it's considered disorderly if you panhandle where uh, money's exchanged and an individual feels uncomfortable, i.e. like an ATM. You go to an ATM and you take your money out and you turn around and the guy's sitting there going, hey, you got a buck? Okay, that 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 could constitute as a, as a disorderly or aggressive panhandling. Um, things of that nature, uh, please, please call call the police department. And I, I have a lot of empathy and compassion for people that don't want to call the police department on an individual who is in need or they perceive as desperate because they don't want to seem unsympathetic. So they pretty much suffer in, in silence. And then, then we hear, um, you know, informally, yeah, you know, two weeks ago I was down here and I was this and I was that, and this happened and that happened. And I ask, you know, very innocently, well, you know, did you call the police? No, I, I, I didn't call the police. We, we need to know that because if there's an individual down there who is being disorderly or aggressive, uh, those are the individuals that, that we want to uh, address because, you know, the mission of the Brattleboro Police Department, our mission statement, steerly, uh, clearly states, you know, know the difference between those in need, those that make a mistake, and those who choose to victimize others. And that's how we deal uh, accordingly. With, with members of the community, with, with those three checkpoints in mind. So we want to take the people that are truly down there being victimizing others. You know, that's, that's, they need to be held accountable for their behavior. Um, if people are truly in need, then we also need to help them get the services that they need. Um, another thing that I failed to mention that I was playing with uh, along with the outreach team is when we do make arrests and bring people down to the uh, police station, we can have them fill out a, a form. And I haven't made it up yet. I'm still just brainstorming as, as we go along. You know, fill out some type of referral form that the outreach team will now get. So we have this individual that was brought in. They don't have to be brought in for a disorderly conduct or aggressive panhandling um, issue. It could be for anything. Uh, just bring them in there and just say, okay, you know, are, are you homeless? Are you this? And once again, I'm getting, I apologize, getting way off with the homeless, but it's also intertwined. Um, but we can talk to them, and then if they don't want to talk to us, we can give, and they, obviously it's optional, we can give their referral sheet to the outreach team so they can try to make contact with them. And um, 
you know, we're not going to hit a home run every time. I realize that. Uh, I expect that. However, I want to be there when that individual finally accepts help. I don't want them to, to come to that place where, okay, I'm ready. Whether that be recovery for an addic addiction, for their situation, I, I don't want them to be ready and then have no one around to help them. I mean, that would be truly tragic. So by us constantly going out of the community and reaching, one of these times they're gonna be like, you know what, you're right. Give me a hand, I need this, I need that. And then hopefully we'll have everything in place uh, that we can get them in and get them the services that they need. Uh, did that answer oh, your yeah. question in yeah. a very long-winded way? No, no, that's okay. Could I, I'd like to um, just go back to Chad's comments uh, a little bit about, or his question, uh, asking us to consider who is our economy for? in Brattleboro? I think it's a, a great question. I think it's important for us to think about that from many different perspectives. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not really working from notes, so I'm, I'm totally extemporizing. But, um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm in a very unique position of representing the merchants, the business owners, and then also the residents. And I get different opinions from both. And even within the merchant group, there's varying opinions about the panhandling issue um, as a, personally and also as a as, as um, and professionally um, you know I'm Catholic so there's certainly you know the moral obligation of alms to the poor so that's my personal struggle professionally I work a lot in developing countries uh, micro lending to women and children to stimulate the economy so, you know, I'm certainly coming to this issue with experience and with a lot of heart. Um, and then at the same time, Chad's question, who is our economy for? Um, I really do need to uh, be very clear that our merchants are struggling. And our merchants who do provide us with a very vibrant downtown, mm -hmm not just for tourists, but for people who live here, um, they're struggling and this issue affects their bottom line daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Um, and so when we talk about who is the economy for, we have to consider the people who are just trying to make rent on their business. And if they don't make rent, it affects the building owner. If the building owner doesn't make rent, they can't make improvements on the building. And we all know what that sort of, you know, the domino effect is of that. Um, so I just want to be really clear that I, I do want to have concrete solutions to help our merchants who on a daily basis, I have gotten lots of feedback that I've shared with the select board and with my panel. Um, our merchants are having to ask people to leave their stoop, their storefront, um, daily. And we will disseminate the survey to get the, to quantify that. Um, that doesn't help anyone in the community. You know, people living in poverty or people with wealth or people who are working class just struggling. It just doesn't help anyone. Poverty sucks. And that's certainly something that everyone in this room agrees on. Crippling our downtown businesses and crippling the downtown economy does not help this issue. And it is not a news flash to anyone here that people panhandling in storefronts deters customers from entering the stores. We have to solve that issue. Um, and some of the uh, models that Josh has shared with me, um, one of them, and I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but one of them is actually having designating panhandling areas in town, right? Um, as Josh mentioned, there's the uh, text, you know, what was it, text to give? Mm -hmm. In Philly, they're using text to give. So instead of giving someone money on the street, you text doesn't feel as heart-centered as giving someone a buck. I agree. Um, another idea that we've discussed is the kiosk, 
where you could put money in at the parking meter, right? Instead of giving it to someone, you put it into a kiosk that collects money for social services to address some of the overarching problems. Also sends the message that as a community, we're 100% compassionate, but we're 0% tolerant of criminal activity or harassment. Um, so I think there are ways that we could really go about this that serves everyone from the grassroots to the top down and meets everybody in the middle. Um, but our merchants do need help with this issue. And I know so many people, again, residents in the downtown improvement district who have said to me, I don't have a problem with panhandlers. I give willingly without worry, right? Which is what the Pope said. So of course, like I want to abide by that too, but, but it does not help many of our downtown business owners. And because I am here representing them, I really want to make that very, very clear. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Does anyone else? Well, well I just I remembered my my okay. <laughs> my last thought and then you may no, have the floor. No. Um, and pardon my ignorance on this if 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 it doesn't come out uh, kind of the way it should but Brattleboro is it, it, this is why I love Brattleboro um, it's a very very giving community um, it, it you couldn't ask for a, a more giving community um, and so that's why I I struggle with the issue of why is there so much panhandling when there's so many social resources for people to go to? Um, you don't go hungry in this town. I mean, there are places to get food. Um, so that that's what I, I'm I, that's what I'm grappling with is you know, and again, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there isn't a lot of places to get food, but from what I know is that there are. You you really don't need to go hungry in this town. Um, so that's why I, I have a hard time with the amount of panhandling and, and where it's located. And I agree, Michelle, that it's, it is crippling. It is crippling our downtown. Um, and where does it move to? You know, I, I, I know one of the ideas of having a panhandle section. <laughs> Who's going to walk by that? You know, we'd, we'd, everybody would avoid that, you know. But... So it's, we've got to come up with, with something to, to really, and I, I'm empathetic to the, to the downtown mer merchants. I really am. I, they're, it is struggling because I hear it from, like Taylor for Flowers, and I hear it from a lot of places. So um, that's what I hear mostly, um, is, is that side of it. So. Oh, yeah, the public. We'll go back to the public. If you can come up. <laughs> Oh yeah. That if you can come up and um, just tell us who you are for the audience watching. George Carvel, I live in West Brattleboro. I hear what you're saying, John, about you know I don't panhandling bothers me. It's not that kind of town. I have the same feeling, but I also feel a lot about the person who's doing the panhandling yeah. and why. Right. Um, what I'd like to suggest to the board tonight is that this not be, uh, okay, we talked about panhandling, we're done. I think if this board really wants to take on this issue, something about a, a monthly report, if you're going to form a committee, great, somebody comes in and keep this issue alive and in focus mm -hmm. until we see some kind of change. That's, that's my challenge to you. It's a good challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I think that our intent was not just to make no, this the it, it, first it's not discussion. Gonna, right. Bob, did you want to say something? So, Bob Ozer, Brattleboro. Um, it's a very big topic. I don't want to take up a lot of time. It's a very, it's very late already. I wanted to underscore a few things. I, I like what the chief said about the concept of an outreach team, um, the developing some mechanism. I would take that a step further or maybe challenge on that, that if there are people who are interested, can they be trained to be part of the outreach team? Mm. Okay. Mm. And I say it this way, uh, I, there are a lot of stories, I think each story, each, I don't know how many panhandlers you think there are downtown, uh, let's say 25, 30. Each one is a very unique story. So 
Whatever that explanation is, John, could be anywhere. Mm. Could be anywhere. And I know some of them. <laughs> but I don't want to tell them necessarily out in public. I'll, I'll, I'll tell two that I already put out in public in response to an article that was in the Commons. A uh, person came to me and said, um, you know, give me a dollar, I think it was two dollars for this prescription, that the copay. And so, okay, so I'm very cynical a lot of times. And I generally don't give money. I do volunteer at the Loaves and Fishes Kitchen mm -hmm. uh, twice a week. I do pots and pans. Um, so, and you're welcome to come Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, check it out. Uh, so I generally don't give money, but I said, you know, well, so what's it for, for the copay? Okay, where is it? Hotel for, okay, let's go. Exactly. Let's go. And you know what? It was a copay Good. for that amount of money. Somebody else came and wanted a non-prescription thing. So I said, well, okay, let me go to the pharmacy. First, pharmacist, is this something you can get high on? Or is this just a, no, no, you can't get high on that. Okay, fine, I'll buy it, you know? And so with each individual, there is then a relationship, you know? And it is true um, in, in, in deference to um, uh, Martin Luther, who caused a lot of problems for Catholics around the 1500s, uh, <laughs> said something to the effect of anything that you give, even if it's used badly, does not reflect negatively upon you. That's true, but I'd like to do something that also has a positive effect, and I think the positive effect can be trying to form a relationship. It's kind of hard and threatening to do that on the street, if you're not already there a little bit, you know, but maybe if there's an outreach team, if there's some training, if people are disposed to kind of maybe figuring out what some of those reasons are. And there's one thing I couldn't find on Google and I still can't, so if you're an expert on Google, check this out. Father Martin wrote books a number of years ago on alcoholism. And in one of his lectures, he calls them chalk talks, and in one of the lectures he says, no one ever gets up on a bright, sunny Monday morning and says, wow, you know, I think I'm gonna sign myself into rehab. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. It's always the judge, the boss, the spouse, somebody who says, you know, I think it's time. And so we need to form a relationship with people to find out what's going on. It may not be all alcohol, substance abuse, maybe other stuff going on, but form those relationships, find out what's going on. And I like your ideas. Thanks, Paul. Sorry if I took up too much time. No. Thanks, Paul. Yes, please come up to the microphone. Hi, I'm Samantha. I work at Groundworks, and I also live in Brattleboro. Um, before I worked at Groundworks, I had an idea of Brattleboro. And after working with Groundworks and interacting with my clients there and other people and getting to know people in the community, I came to realize that there are two separate distinct Brattleboro is that if you do not interact with people, you won't have really an idea, idea of um, this other Brattleboro. People are really struggling. It's like really hard to make ends meet. And um, I think that people don't realize how much it takes for someone to be on the street asking for money. I think um, that really takes away a little bit of their dignity. So um, also in conjunction with your great ideas, I'd like to see um, maybe some outreach to the communities for people to get an idea of what's going on in Brattleboro, how the economy is affecting people, and how much of a struggle it is out there for people so that we could have a little more compassion and empathy with the way that we approach people in the streets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the public? Um, Brandy or Tim, I do wanted to say something, didn't you? Um, thank you, Tim, for bringing this very hard conversation forward, um, where people can sometimes feel judged for their feelings. Um, I appreciate it coming forward, and I appreciate you being here with us. I love all of these ideas. I'm particularly fond of the job program and the outreach task force, but they were all good. Um, I would be one of those people that would love to be 
trade to be someone that goes along with that and, and does that kind of work. I think it's easy when we walk by people to kind of lose sight of what might be going on, and I particularly should never do that um, given my past. Uh, I almost always only have a debit card, and the one thing that I do is if people come up to me, I say, I only have a debit card, but do you want to run into the works or Amy's and I'll buy you a sandwich, and I've never had anybody turn me down, and I usually buy a sandwich, a bag of chips, and a drink and sometimes a brownie, because everybody needs a brownie. Um, <laughs> um, I don't really know how to solve it from the perspective of we need to end, you know, I know that merchants are struggling because I hear it from merchants. I've heard, I've seen merchants leave their, their cash registers while I'm in there to go out and speak to people. I've never felt harassed, but I can feel the tension from people that are feeling worn down by it. And I think if we, move on these items that you suggested if you were to to move on those quickly i think it would be a good start i love the jobs thing because i think it helps boost people's self-esteem too i know a guy that a local business lets them she lets him sweep um and he's always happy and he's always gracious and stops sweeping to hold the door and then he gets in return he gets to have lunch Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of the jobs program, and I think it's interesting to note that Portland, Maine passed ordinances to begin with. They were trying to ban people from particular hotspot medians in town. It proved ineffective, so they switched to this jobs program. They're just piloting. It started this summer. It's a 36-week pilot. I, I would love to take a trip up there and find out the nitty-gritty of the process of how they do it, how they're able to administrate it, um, and that kind of thing. I think it's great, and to your point, for people to have a low barrier way to make a contribution as well. Um, it's it's very important for people to be able to make a contribution, and you know I agree with Sam. I get to work with Sam every day, but it takes away uh, a piece of folks' dignity to sit out on the street. I also think that it could be a boon for Brattleboro as well. I don't know if you search uh, panhandling jobs. Portland, it's picked up all over the place. And in terms of PR for the town, it was picked up in the New York Times, this kind of thing. It, a program such as this doesn't have necessarily have to be solely focused on the individual that benefits from the program. It can be a benefit for the whole town itself. Great, thanks. Does any, does anyone have wise wit, do, any words of wisdom, Tim? Me? <laughs> <laughs> or I know so right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess after, I think I, I have to say I, I was hoping for a little bit, few more comments from merchants, but I'm going to, I think I'll speak for them from based on uh, a few that I've heard from personally. And I think uh, a lot of merchants don't want to be seen as the bad guy or, or heartless and, um, there is a lot of struggle and a lot of kind of borderline scary anecdotes that come along with this. Um, so I, I think possibly, I definitely want to see the survey. <laughs> I mean, that, that data, I, I love data anyway, but I mean, I really want to hear from merchants and everybody you represent, Michelle, um, to hear more about things like where exactly are the hotspots, say. Um, what strategies in the past have worked and what hasn't, and if any of those funnel into some of these solutions that we've looked at tonight, uh, that the panel has kind of uh, come forward with, um, is there any other, I guess I'm curious, you know, going back to Tom's, you know, how do we help others help them? Are there any merchants that wanna just speak towards any of those suggestions? because that's a little easier than sort of explaining the problem out front and sort of describing the problem you're having personally. I was just wondering if anyone wants to react to some of these ideas. Looks Can like we might have a take. Uh, Dick the Gray, Prattleboro. Um, if I asked all of you who are sitting in front of me the number of people that panhandle on a daily basis, uh, I bet you couldn't give me a number within three people. I can tell you because I'm on the street 
that have a pretty good idea of how many people are panhandling every day and who they are. And I, although I don't know their situations, I have a fairly good idea. Uh, when Robert was talking about uh, the young man who asked him for a couple of bucks for uh, to help him get a prescription, those are minority stories. There's always going to be an exception to the rule. The people that I see panhandling, I see the majority of the people I see panhandling, I see them in different catatonic states through different times of the day. And that's a lot different than somebody who needs money for food, uh, who needs money for rent. I see a gentleman every morning. He's not a panhandler. I know he's got two children because I've seen him on the street. And I'm on the street every morning at 3.15 in the morning. And this guy is going through all the trash cans picking up, picking out cans. And I told him the other day, I said, you're a great dad. He goes and picks the trash cans to provide for his kids. I've never seen this guy panhandle, but he's out on the street every damn morning going through every trash can. And I've seen him with his kids, and he's a great dad with his kids, and it's a phenomenal story. It's the people that sit in Harmony parking lot. You want to know where they panhandle the hot spots? They sit by the pay and display meters at the Harmony parking lot. They're down on Kyle Gilbert Bridge. They're down on the bridge as you come up from Hinsdale. And if you're fortunate, when you're walking around downtown, you can get hit five or six times. And if you wonder if that's not having an impact, it is. And all the advertising and good publicity that we get from the good things that are happening in Brattleboro can't overcome word of mouth. And so when you're a tourist coming to town or you're a resident coming in town and saying, I'm not going downtown. There's so many panhandlers down there. I don't feel safe. Regardless of whether they're uh, accosting you. When you see someone with a sign and they're asking you for money, you know, by the time you call the police, and I have called them uh, because I know some of the people and they really follow you. And so I call the police department, I call dispatch. And you know what? That's not a priority for the police department. And that's not saying anything disrespectful about the police department. There are more important issues than panhandling. And so they don't get there as quickly, and they might leave by the time an officer arrives. So it, the situation is not easily solvable. Having a discussion is great. And I've been a part of several different discussions, and I always say, what's the action plan after the, the discussion? And always having a conversation, everybody is juiced up, they walk out of the room, and they go, okay, we talked about it, and then nothing happens. Nothing ever happens. And then we'll have a meeting in three months, and we'll talk about it again, and nothing happens. And so, from the suggestions that I've heard here this evening, I can support any one of them. But not doing anything is not an option here anymore. Because if I need to come here, every two weeks and talk about it because I see it and I see what it does to the people downtown and I see the fact that when they come into your store and they talk about it uh, it is having an impact and I don't I wish I could say if you do this it's going to stop there's not anybody in this room that's going to say if we do this you know we've had we had people that, actually I haven't seen them, they were here earlier in the year. When they would come to town, they just lay on the sidewalk. There's some business owners here who they were laying on the sidewalk in front of their business. I was absolutely appalled. 
and there wasn't really anything that we could do about it. But I called the police, they came down, and they actually got them to move, and I'm going, this isn't right. We've got a great community, We've got a lot of pride in our community. John is right, there's a lot of services in our community. People, this is one of the biggest giving communities I know. Mm -hmm. And I used to talk about when I sat up there where you are, the Christmas stocking and Project Feed the Thousands, you're talking over a half a million dollars that was donated for giving people in our community. That's outstanding. And so there isn't really a reason to have panhandlers on the street. And I think the chief's on to something where you go up to people, how can we help you? What's your situation? The more we know about someone, the better off we're going to help them. Okay, I know Dick DeGray, he does work downtown. He needs some help for a day or two. Let me put you in contact with him. But if we sit here and we talk about it and we leave here and we do another survey, with all due respect, I love surveys, and then they sit on the shelf. So hopefully with a survey and with you people that there's an action plan and you say, you know what, by the end of October, we're going to have an action plan in place that we're going to try, whether it's a pilot program or something that we're going to do rather than put our hands in our pocket. Do you see those people over by the pay and display meter? God, they drive me crazy. So let's do something. You know, you had a big discussion about diversity. Uh, and I thought that that was a healthy conversation for you to have. And maybe these conversations are uncomfortable to have. But they need to happen. And we need to find a solution that's compassionate. But we also have to understand that not doing anything is not an option because it's having an impact on businesses downtown. And... You know, everybody thinks if you own a business downtown, the money's falling out of your pockets. It's a grind. It is really a grind to have a business downtown. And when you have negative things happening, that has an impact on your bottom line. And so I know that, that the people downtown, the merchants downtown, they get hit, hit every day with people walking in. Somebody wants a gift for their organization. They're going to have a raffle. So those people are walking in those stores. Well and they're always giving. And so if we're impeding people to go and shop in those stores in any way, shape, or form, you know, the giving is going to stop, the storefronts are going to close, and uh, we're going to be back to where we were in the late 80s, early 90s. And I hope that doesn't happen. But I know that we have some bright people up there and we have some energy over here that I think will find a solution uh, going forward, and I do hope you put some sort of date on it to make you push forward to say, you know what, by October we're going to roll, whatever the date is, it's arbitrary, but hopefully sooner rather than later, that we're going to roll something out in some sort of experiment. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, and I think Thanks. I'm going to speak on behalf of a lot of people so people can jump on me. I think what the plan would be is that, um, you know, Michelle and I would work on the survey together in our respective roles. Josh and our town manager would sort of work together on the jobs program investigating that. Um, the chief was going to work on the task force. Um, and we should have the, the, the collection box was another one. Yeah. Josh, Josh, Josh can you work on that? And what I thought we would do is, um, and I, we don't know which September meeting it would be, but come back at the September meeting and, you know, either say this is what we've done or, you know, this is what we found. Um, and so we're, you know, committed, I think, here, and I'm assuming I by them being here tonight, that we're all committed to moving something forward and just not having a conversation. Um, but the September meeting will give us all some time to do the things that we need to do so that we can report back and see what the, yeah. what we and can I, do. Yeah, and I also think we should get Bob Fisher involved in the, the legal aspect. Right. You, know, yep. you know, what are our limitations and what are, you know, just, yeah. just to have a, you know, a ballpark or a, 
something to go by. Yeah, and I think it's important that we all remember that we're not gonna solve the problem. I mean, I would love to have the town of Brattleboro figure out the, the solution to this problem because we'd be the model mm -hmm. town for the entire United States of America. Um, but I think we there's a commitment based on the fact that we're having this conversation and that you know these people are here and you folks are here. There's a commitment to do something to um, fix it as much as we possibly can. Um, so I don't know if that sounds. I agree. Does that Is sound there anything else Tim? that you guys want to? I, no. I love the idea, I mean, the Chief's idea of the outreach program, yeah. I think, is yeah. so great on a number of levels because it's actionable pretty quickly, and yeah. it's also going to involve a lot of learning, I think. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that learning will feed into some of these other ideas, too, mm -hmm. I think, and, and seeing if they're viable mm -hmm. for the town. Mm -hmm. I love the job one. I, I just, I think that's spectacular. I mean, that because everybody wants to give back. I think most people do want to feel like they're contributing to some degree. And I, I just, I've always said, I thought that's a, that's a good idea, very good idea. Does that make sense to everybody? We'll do our work and we'll come back at one of the September meetings. You know, and in the meantime, if anybody in the public has any suggestions or ideas that you didn't want to talk about this evening, you know, feel free to contact any of us or the town manager's office, and because um, we want to hear from from people, and um, that's our goal, and we we'll just push forward. There is a commitment to push forward. Yes, I'm sorry. Please come up. Hi, I'm Sherry Stewart. Sorry that I came in late to the conversation. This is actually the conversation I came in for tonight, and I was really hoping not to speak publicly because I really don't feel like it tonight. But I feel urged to just say, um, I really don't want to be, mar I don't want our town to be marginalizing people who are already vulnerable and weak. Um, I, and I love the jobs program idea. I read the, the, uh, the piece on, on the commons and um, and the uh, refer the reference to Portland and their program and I think it's a great idea um, but I also um, think that it can be hard for people when they're living on the street to have the energy to work so I hope that um, any program that may be implemented would keep that in mind and um, um, not make it imperative that people you know have to get up and work during the day when they mm -hmm. are sleeping on the street. And I also want to say, um, in response to uh, one thing that Dick said, I'm on the streets, I'm downtown every day, and I actually pass through one of the places where there's a lot of panhandling to the co-op every single evening. It seems like I have some reason to go to the co-op. Um, and I know that the panhandlers are at either entrance to the co-op, on the bridge over the whetstone, and on the bridge through, um, over the whetstone that goes through the co-op lot off of Flat Street. And <clears throat> sometimes I feel annoyed by the panhandling, but I just, um, you know, people are free to be on the street. This is, this is one of the problems that we face in a free society. And I really just don't want to see only the owning class um, making decisions about how people who are homeless should live. I, I think if, you, if you've gotten to that point where you have to panhandle, whether it's for drug addiction reasons, which I think a lot of them, for a lot of them that is the reason, I think that um, it's, it's hard enough already. Um, and again, I think I, I missed probably some really good ideas that were presented at the beginning of the conversation. And I want to just say I am really impressed with the community policing that's been happening. Um, several times on my way through the uh, transportation center, I've run into uh, someone on the beat who's interacting with some of the homeless people who are panhandling. And I'm really impressed by the humanity that this police force is showing. So. Uh, I'm probably missing a point or two, but I think I've rambled and pretty much covered it all. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, so I guess the plan is we will 
come back again to publicly talk about this again at one of our September meetings. In the meantime, we'll all work behind the scenes to make some progress. Does that sound good? Excellent. Okay, great. Um, what I'd like to do is take a quick break and we'll come back a little before five of, and then we will be done by 9.05. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for jinxing that, Kate. <laughs> Okay, we're back. Yeah, we're live. All right, we're doing the Community Drug Interdiction Program Grant. And it's a two-part um, piece. This is the funding that we received from the state of Vermont that funds the town's participation in the Regional Drug Task Force. Um, the uh, We've received a supplemental grant for the fiscal year just ended of $5,000, and our basic grant for the year ahead is $90,000, and so um, we've wrapped the two of those into one proposed motion for to um, accept and appropriate those grants. Terrific. So we got more. Um, does anyone on the board have any questions about this? Does anyone in the public have any questions Seems about the drug, <laughs> drug interdiction grants? Pete, what do you think? There's our one stand fast because always you here. Stoic. Um, would somebody like to make a motion? Sure. To accept and appropriate two community drug interdiction program grants, an amendment to increase an existing fiscal year 17 grant by $5,000 and a new $90,000 grant for fiscal year 18 from the Vermont Department of Public Safety. Great, John has made a motion to accept and appropriate two drug, two community drug interdiction program grants. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Next up is our quarterly review of our goals. And I think we decided, we decided to do this so that we would keep ourselves, just at least know where we are. Mm -hmm. But sometimes things come up. Um, I don't know, does, would you, Peter, like to go over these, or do you want me sure. to? Sure. Well, um, let me say this, and then you can decide yep. um, how deep a dive you'd like to take. There are 14 goals um, that you adopted back on May 16th uh, for this select board year. And of those, um, there are really only three or four that are not getting some kind of attention at this point. Right. Um, and, and some are actually pretty far along, substantively. So um, we could, if you'd like, take a minute and go down each of the 14 mm -hmm. and talk about where we are. Um, in the interest of time, if you prefer, it, the, we can note for the public's benefit that um, the material that's posted to the website has a written summary yep. on each one of these 14 yep. um, the, from the material that was in the select board notebook for this yep. weekend. Um, and And... You know, we can take up individual pieces of it if there's individual pieces you think need discussion. Um, I'm, I'm happy to work with you whichever way you'd like in terms of summarizing where we are. Right. What I, th what I would think, if everybody um, agrees with this or, you know, if you don't, you can say, is just, are there anything that is concerning to any of us on the board on where we should be on these goals like is there anything I think Brandy has one thing she wants to read but I do. is there anything that you think we should be doing better on I mean I guess that's the ultimate question is how do we feel well no I, I know that this is going to take a while but the pilot thing is you know is but we haven't started working on it and I know that's going to take a lot of that's going to take some time and, oh, yeah. but and there's going to be a legal element to that exactly. there that is, yes. needs to be that's thoroughly right. researched before right. we go out and start to try to actually exactly. address it. Yeah. But, I mean, that's been on the table for a bunch forever. of years. Right. For, you know, forever. So, But I'd like to see a little bit of movement forward on yeah. that one. Yeah. That's yeah. all. That's the only one that bothers me a little bit. I'm with you there. I, I think that we're doing a... I don't want to say, job. we're doing a great job. But, <laughs> you know, when I look at this, I always like to see things quantified on paper, you know, because it feels so abstract and we're just talking. And I, yeah. I think this looks great, and I'm really pleased with it. Um, it makes me feel good to see it written down. And I do have notes from David. I don't know when you'd like me to read oh, those. Oh, sure. Go for it. I feel like I should read all of it. No, it's kind of funny. David Scholes, uh, who couldn't be here, says that he's in a tent on the beach, and... He writes to ask that he is represented on one of the agenda items as part of public engagement for the select board goals. He is asking that we consider posting the story of how he decided to use gas instead of heat pumps in the new facility. And 
whether we would consider a policy of posting about the process on, on, on all future energy, energy decisions. I think, you know, what I hear him saying here is press releases that maybe we share online about some background on why we didn't choose heat pumps and we chose um, fossil fuel instead. And uh, in the future, any background information that we have on why we make energy decisions that we do for the public to keep them informed. Okay. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I'm, I'm not against doing that. I think, though, I mean, it shouldn't be a press story. No, I, I, know, I don't mean any disrespect to the news media, but posting a story that somebody else wrote about what we're doing, I worry about. I mean, I think if we're oh, sending out a press release. That's what I meant. OK. Yeah. And that's what I think yeah. he means, okay. too. Because I don't want to say that sometimes the press gets it wrong. Please don't get mad at me, everybody no. watching in the, in the world. We'll just say it's hey, better to come from the horse's that? mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, Do you know what I mean? We have minutes to the meetings, too. Right. I'm trying to understand exactly what he's talking about. I, yeah, I, I, I think, I think uh, is he referring to some explanations that have already been made as far as vis a vis the uh, I think the he's asking station? for them to be put in writing and shared out because he thinks there's some confusion. Uh, oh, oh. They might be in our minutes. Right. They might be. But, there, there or, are. or at least in, in the town manager's report. And so, then it, it, is he referring to the, the police fire project? I think so. It doesn't say. Maybe in, what we need to do is when he gets part, back here, talk yeah, to I him. Yeah, I think that's better. Yeah, because yeah. I think we're all reading right. into something. Yeah. yeah. It would be better Why to get out of his tent and get back here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's probably asleep by now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the mosquito. Okay. okay, so everybody feel okay? Yeah. No, okay. I think we're doing fine. Can you look at this? We're not doing Okay. Please. Next up, we have a few committee appointments to make. Um, two members of the Energy Committee and one person to the Cemetery Committee. We did not do interviews because um, we didn't have more people apply than there were seats available. So um, what we normally do, I don't know if people want to make I'll nominate, the nominations. Yeah. I'll nominate Jackie Stromberg to the Cemetery Committee for a three-year term. John has nominated Jackie Stromberg to the Cemetery Committee. Um, are there any other nominations? Everyone in favor of appointing Jackie Stromberg, please say aye. 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 Anyone against? Um, Jackie Stromberg is appointed to the Cemetery Committee by a vote of 4 0. Um, Energy Committee is up next. I'll make a motion to appoint Tad Montgomery for a three year term to the Energy Committee. Do you want to do Rose at the same time? And Roseanne oh. Grimes for a three-year term to the Energy Committee. Um, are there any nominations for the Energy Committee? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of appointing Tad Montgomery and Roseanne Grimes to three-year terms on the Energy Committee, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, by a vote of 4-0, Tad and Roseanne are appointed to the Energy Committee. We are done our business. So would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed? Four. We <laughs> We're listening to ourselves. Um, Sorry. Um, okay. By vote four zero, we are adjourning. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. I Good night, Pete. Good night. Bye, everybody.